Being present, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today, the Rules Committee is meeting on one of the gravest and most consequential responsibilities of the House of Representatives. We are considering House Resolution 918, authorizing an impeachment inquiry to examine the President of the United States. It is a deeply sad day and is an occasion I do not relish, nor I am sure do any of my colleagues in the room. Nonetheless, this is a weighty responsibility, one that we all take very seriously, and we must do our duty for ourselves, for the institution, and for the nation. We are here to determine a process, not an outcome. We are here to assert our Article I responsibilities, not to act as judge or jury. And we are here fundamentally to chart a path forward that unveils the facts to the public. Committees in the House uh, have been engaged in investigating. As they continue to pursue transparency and accountability, we are formalizing their impeachment inquiry efforts to give the House the strongest legal standing to pursue needed information and enforce subpoenas allowing this chamber to be at the apex of its constitutional power is vital to our system of checks and balances. I will briefly summarize the procedures today's resolution establishes for the inquiry. First, it charges the Committee on Oversight and Reform, the Committee on Ways and Means, and the Committee on the Judiciary with continuing the existing inquiry. It preside, provides procedures for conducting hearings and calling and questioning witnesses. It grants the minority equal time to question and request witnesses. It ensures investigating committees can prepare and transmit reports and documents to the Committee on the Judiciary, which traditionally considers impeachment. It gives the President and his counsel opportunities to participate in proceedings before the Committee on the Judiciary. Finally, it authorizes the Committee on the Judiciary to report to the House of Representatives resolutions, articles of impeachment, or other recommendations. If these procedures sound familiar, they should. In preparing this draft resolution, we have followed the blueprint House Democrats followed in 2019 and have drafted this resolution to closely follow House Resolution 660 from the 116th Congress. I know my friends in the minority will point out the obvious. House Republicans expressed concerns with this approach and did not support these procedures previously. How then can we support them now? The answer is, of course, that what the, then, the then majority Democrats did in 2019 is now a precedent of the House of Representatives. Having created this procedure in 2019, it's appropriate that we follow it in 2023. Before I conclude, I know today's hearing uh, may well be a heated one. This is a difficult topic, one that sparks passions on both sides. In 2019, under the leadership of my friend, our ranking member, we were able to push through our markup with a minimum of rancor. I'm hopeful that we will again be able to do so today. Every person in this room is here because we care about this great nation of ours. Everyone is here because we believe we can make America a better place for all of our citizens. No one here, least of all myself, relishes meeting on this topic today. But I know that we will do our duty, difficult as today may be. I now yield to my very good friend, our ranking member, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Cole. And um, I just want to respond to something uh, you said. Uh, 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 we are not here to begin a proceeding. Uh, there's been uh, an impeachment inquiry from day one that has been going on here. Um, and I think it's proven time and time again that the President of the United States did absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, but this is a very, very sad day for this committee and for this institution and for this country. This impeachment sham is, to put it bluntly, an extreme political stunt. It has no credibility, no legitimacy, and no integrity. It's a distraction to draw our attention away from House Republicans, do nothing Congress, that has failed to pass any meaningful laws to help the American people. And it's a shocking weaponization of the impeachment process by MAGA extremists who are dead set on doing anything and everything they can to help elect Donald Trump. Now, when I was chairman of this committee, Donald Trump was impeached twice. Both times I took it very seriously. His first impeachment, 
was because he tried to blackmail a foreign leader into digging up dirt on then-candidate Joe Biden. He wanted to stop Joe Biden from becoming president. His second impeachment, the most bipartisan in history, was because he tried to overturn the election by sending a violent mob here to the Capitol to stop us from certifying Joe Biden's victory as the Constitution requires us to do. He wanted to stop Biden from taking office. Thankfully, he failed. But now Republicans are back at it again, trying to hurt Joe Biden, this time by abusing and weaponizing the impeachment process itself. All of this is happening because House Republican leaders refuse to abide by the election result. They're upset Trump uh, lost. He's upset he lost. Some of them still don't even believe he lost. Many of them are upset that the insurrection didn't succeed on January 6th. And today, they want to finish the job. And what's left in the toolbox? An impeachment stunt they want to hang around Joe Biden's neck to tarnish him as he heads into the next election. They think it will muddy the waters and confuse people who know in their gut that Trump is a criminal and Joe Biden is an honest, decent man. Let me tell Republicans right now, you will fail. Because the simple truth is your whole so-called investigation is built on a lie. Republicans began this ludicrous exercise the second they took control of this House of Representatives, the very second they took control. And it's been a big, colossal waste of time ever since. It's been a pathetic joke. Not a single witness, not a shred of evidence that says Joe Biden did anything wrong. Every single Republican allegation has been debunked and discredited and disproven. Their own legal experts say there's not enough evidence to impeach. Their blistering bombshell key witness, he turned out to be a Chinese spy. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Their own speaker, Republican Mike Johnson, said just a few weeks ago that there's insufficient evidence to even initiate formal impeachment proceedings. Their own members, a Republican on the House Oversight Committee, was asked two weeks ago on Fox News, have you uncovered any wrongdoing by President Biden? She said, and I quote, the short answer is no. So Republicans have spent a year looking for dirt on Joe Biden, a year trying to make their bogus allegations stick, and at the end of it all, they have found nothing, no wrongdoing. So what is this about then? I think the answer is obvious. Republicans want to distract from their own ineffectiveness and incompetence, and they want to do everything and anything to help Donald Trump win the next election. The far-right MAGA extremists are in charge of the House of Representatives. They have neutered all the moderate Republicans and obliterated bipartisanship. And they want to cover up their own failure with this ridiculous political stunt. Donald Trump says, jump. The MAGA extremists say, how high? Donald Trump asked them to impeach Joe Biden, and here we are. They broke the law trying to stop Joe Biden from becoming president. They broke the law trying to violently overturn the election to prevent Joe Biden from taking office. And now they are waging this extreme political stunt by abusing and weaponizing the impeachment process. They tried to overturn the election on January 6th, and now they want to finish the job. And today, Democrats on the Rules Committee will make a simple case to the American people. First, that Joe Biden is a man of decency and integrity who respects the law and this impeachment charade is an extreme political stunt designed to help Donald Trump win. Second, that every absurd Republican allegation against Joe Biden has been debunked. Third, that despite this fraudulent process, Republicans have received extraordinary cooperation from the White House. And fourth, that Republicans are doing this because they are focused on the wrong priorities and want to distract from their total failure to get anything done. And when this is all over, I am confident that the American people will overwhelmingly agree that this whole impeachment stunt is a national dis disgrace, designed to distract from their own incompetence and to help Donald Trump, a twice impeached ex-president who's been indicted more times than he's been elected. I'm confident that they will see that this is about vengeance, retaliation, and distraction. Those on the far right of the Republican Party have nothing to show for their time and power. They have never accepted that Joe Biden won. Obviously, they have contempt for the American people, and they are once again trying to overturn the election. 
they are willing to do anything and everything to get their way, our democracy be damned. And my so-called moderate colleagues on the other side of the aisle are unwilling or unable to say enough is enough to those who are dead set on pursuing this extreme nonsense. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Pursuant to notice, I now call up House Resolution 918, directing certain committees to continue their ongoing investigation as part of the existing House of Representatives inquiry into whether sufficient grounds exist for the House of Representatives to exercise its constitutional power to impeach Joseph Biden, President of the United States of America, and for other purposes. Without objection, the resolution will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Is there any discussion or amendment? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, now, the clerk will report the resolution. Amendment number one to House Resolution 918, offered by Mr. McGovern. Clerk will suspend. Um, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. I object, Mr. Chair. I'd like to have the amendment read. Clerk will report the resolution. House Resolution 918. Just for the purpose, of, uh, does the gentleman seek recognition? Yes, I, I would. I, okay, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number one to House Resolution 918, offered by Mr. McGovern. Before the resolve clause, insert the following. Whereas President Biden began his lifetime of public service serving on the Newcastle County Council before becoming one of the youngest people ever elected to the United States Senate at age 29, Whereas President Biden honorably represented Delaware for 36 years in the Senate before being elected vice president and ultimately president, where he has rebuilt our standing on the world stage and overseen the strongest job growth in American history. And whereas Donald Trump was impeached on a bipartisan basis, has been found liable for sexual abuse and for committee fraud and lying about his net worth has been impeached twice and is facing a total of 91 felony charges across four different state and federal criminal cases. Now, therefore, be it. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the, the purpose of this amendment is to clarify that there is no comparison between the honesty and integrity of President Joe Biden and the dishonesty and lawlessness of Donald Trump. President Biden is a decent man, an honorable man. He follows the law and cares about, cares about upholding his oath of office. President Biden has dedicated his entire career to public service, a great personal cost to himself and to his family. President Biden has rebuilt our standing on the world stage. He has overseen the strongest job growth in American history. He has passed one of the most ambitious legislative agendas I have seen during my, my entire time in Congress. And my Republican colleagues know this. They know Joe Biden is a good man and that Donald Trump is a criminal. So they want to put something on the other side of the scale because they know that Trump's guilty as hell. Donald Trump tried to blackmail a foreign head of state to dig up political dirt on Joe Biden. Donald Trump tried to overturn an election because he lost to Joe Biden sending a violent mob here to the Capitol on January 6th to try to stop the certification of the election. Donald Trump's kids stole money from a cancer charity. Donald Trump's son-in-law took $2 billion from the Saudi government in a deal so shady that it would make even Richard Nixon blush. Donald Trump has been indicted more times than he's been elected. And it's clear to me why Republicans are going after Joe Biden and trying to drag his name through the mud. They want, to, they want to help normalize Donald Trump's corruption and criminality. They want to convince people that everyone does it, so it doesn't matter. Well, guess what? Everyone doesn't do it, and it does matter. There's no comparison, none whatsoever, between the decency, civility, and public service of Joe Biden and the criminality, corruption, and abuse of power of Donald Trump. Republicans launched this absurd inquiry almost a year ago. 
And here's what we've learned. We've learned that this investigation has received extraordinary cooperation from the Biden administration <coughs> and has yielded mountains of proof that all confirms President Biden follows and respects the law. We've learned that President Biden is a good dad, that he loves his son unconditionally. We've learned that his son, Hunter, lost his mom and sister in a terrible car accident. He lost his brother to cancer. This is someone with a, with a lot of trauma in his life and who sadly turned to drugs. And we've seen that Republicans have sought to weaponize that trauma and use it to attack President Biden and his family. Frankly, uh, it's just disgusting. I mean, we literally had Marjorie Taylor Greene hold up explicit photos of Hunter Biden at a committee hearing. And it's unclear to me whether Republicans are so full of it that they actually believe this stuff or it's all for show. But either way, I find it to be so awful and just really offensive and quite frankly, rotten. And after 10 months of digging and tens of thousands of pages of documents, all Republicans have proven is that President Biden did nothing wrong. But they don't care that they've found no evidence because for them, this is all just about weaponizing and abusing the impeachment process in order to hurt President Biden. Quote, they did it to me. That's what Trump said in an interview a few months ago. A further quote, and had they not done it to me, I think, and nobody officially said this, but I think had they not done it to me, perhaps you wouldn't have it being done to them, end quote. Now let that sink in. The whole impeachment stunt is happening because the former president demanded that MAGA extremists in Congress impeach Joe Biden. They don't care about the evidence. They don't care about the truth. They don't care about the damage this will do to our country or to this institution quote, either impeach the bum or fade into oblivion. That's what the former president says on social media. Either impeach the bum or fade into oblivion. So that's why we're here today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I urge adoption of my amendment and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. As for roll call. Roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Clinton, no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. No. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Neguse. Aye. Mr. Neguse, aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. The noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. Any further amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentlelady from New Mexico is recognized. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. You would Mr. Chair, I have an amendment. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number two to House Resolution 918, offered by Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Before the resolve clause, insert the following. Whereas, in the last impeachment proceedings against then-President Donald Trump, there was extensive evidence and thousands of hours of video footage of a violent attack on the Capitol that led to the deaths of five law enforcement officers and seriously injured more than 140 more. Whereas the violent attack on the Capitol delayed a constitutional electoral proceeding while Trump, who incited the attack, watched it unfold for hours without intervening according, uh, according the testimony of Trump staffers before the United States House Select Committee on the January 6th attack. Whereas the evidence in the 2021 impeachment proceedings against then President Donald Trump showed that Trump sought to overturn the election and interfere with the pre peaceful transfer of power for the first time in the, United, in the United States history. Whereas such evidence led to a bipartisan impeachment in the House, a bipartisan vote of 57 senators to convict Trump in the Senate, and a federal criminal indictment related to the January 6th assault and efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Whereas in the 11 months since the Republican-led committees, the Committee on Oversight and Accountability, the Committee on the Judiciary, and the Committee on Ways and Means first began their investigations, Republicans have received tens of thousands of pages of private bank records, Department of Treasury, the National Archives, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and Internal Revenue Service documents, 
and dozens of hours of witness testimony, including special counsel Weiss and other high-ranking officials at the FBI, IRS, and Department of Justice attorney assigned to Hunter Biden's case. Whereas, despite the avalanche of information House Republicans received from the Biden administration, banks, and Hunter Biden's business associates, none of the three Republican-led House committees pursuing a Biden impeachment has found any evidence of wrongdoing by the president, let alone an impeachable offense, whereas Senate Republicans who conducted their own investigation in 2020 of Joe Biden's conduct as vice president also did not find any evidence of wrongdoing. Whereas the evidence, including bank records and repeated statements from witnesses gathered during the current investigation, has shown that President Biden fought corruption, was not involved in his family members' business dealings, and respected the independence of the Department of Justice. Whereas the Burisma conspiracy theory that has long been debunked, and in fact the investigation has confirmed that as Vice President, Joe Biden successfully led a bipartisan and international coalition urging the Ukrainian government to address corruption. Whereas President Joe Biden chose to retain David Weiss, a United States attorney appointed by Donald Trump, as the special counsel leading the Hunter Biden investigation, and it is, it is clear that Mr. Weiss has the full authority to investigate and prosecute Hunter Biden. Whereas, while the last Trump impeachment proceedings held public hearings, House Republicans have conducted nearly all of their investigation into President Joe Biden behind closed doors, have refused to publicly release all but two interview transcripts, and have repeatedly misrepresented the evidence, including witnesses' statements, to falsely accuse the president of wrongdoing. Whereas, as a loving father and a brother, Joe Biden has helped members of his family in their times of need. Whereas, 46,300,000 Americans aged 12 or older, or 16.5% of the United States population, had a substance use disorder in the past, and two-thirds of Americans reported they or a family member struggle with addiction. Whereas, addiction significantly impacts families whose loved ones suffer from substance abuse. And whereas, loving a son who has struggled with addiction and other problems is not evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors worthy of a solemn impeachment inquiry. Now for there be it. General Lady is recognized uh, to uh, explain or address her amendment. Mr. Chair, I offer this amendment to remind the American people that after 11 months, three different committees investigating and a mountain of documents and testimony, Republicans have no evidence of wrongdoing by President Joe Biden. Instead, the Republican-led investigation has proven the opposite, that this is political vengeance for the impeachment of Donald Trump. Republicans have bent over backwards to distort the truth because the twice impeached, four times indicted for former president, who currently has 91 felony charges pending in both federal and state courts, wants them to. While Republicans say they need this inquiry to gather yet more evidence, they are deceiving themselves. They just don't like what the extensive evidence they've accumulated so far actually proves. President Biden and his administration voluntarily handed over tens of thousands of pages of private bank records, treasury and national archives documents. Biden administration officials from the FBI, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Department of Justice, along with Department of Justice special counsel attorney assigned to Hunter Biden case, have provided dozens of hours of sworn testimony. After extraordinary transparency from the Biden administration, the evidence proves that Biden, President Biden did not engage in any wrongdoing. The evidence proves that President Biden did not profit and did not engage in James or Hunter Biden's business. Further, President Biden respected he respected the independence of the Department of Justice and retained David Weiss, the U.S. attorney appointed by President Trump as a special counsel leading the Hunter Biden investigation. The indictments this week of Hunter Biden prove, they prove that special counsel Weiss had full independent discretion to investigate and prosecute Hunter Biden free from political interference. But remember, Impeachment is about what the president does, not what his son may have done. Biden's respect for the Justice Department is in sharp contrast to Trump, who urged his Department of Justice to investigate his political opponents. President Trump's own Attorney General, Bill Barr, 
had to resign in protest as Trump weaponized the Department of Justice after losing the 2020 election. Biden's respect for the law, no matter the consequence for his son, is the exact opposite of Trump's declaration he will be a dictator and will purge our agencies of our civil servants if he believes they are his enemies or unfriendly. Republicans often talk about Burisa, a far-fetched conspiracy theory, but Trump's own special representative for Ukraine negotiations, Kurt Volker, found that Burisma was based on a theory that, I quote, had been debunked, end quote. And there was, I quote again, no evidence to support it, close quote. The more than 39,000 pages of documents Republicans already received and the 62,000 on the way prove that President Biden follows the rule of law as he has done his entire career. He has fought corruption at home and abroad and has upheld his most sacred oaths to the Constitution, an oath he has made 10 times throughout his dedicated career of public service. In contrast, we've seen House Republicans repeatedly conceal information, hide it from the public, and selectively leak lies and innuendo that distorts the truth. While the America public, while the American public waits for Congress to do its job to fund our government and lower costs, extreme MAGA Republicans want an impeachment inquiry to create more division, more chaos. This do-nothing Congress is all about chaos. It's a do-nothing but chaos Congress. The American people know what evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors looks like. We know what it feels like. Evidence of an impeachable offense looks like the January 6th insurrection, where a violent mob stormed the Capitol and threatened to hang Vice President Pence and kill Speaker Pelosi. They attacked us because Trump wanted to delay the certification and overturn the 2020 election. That violent attack on our democracy led to the death of five law enforcement officers and seriously injured 140 more officers. When you walk out of this room, look with kindness and gratitude in your heart at the Capitol Police protecting us. They know, they know what evidence of an impeachable offense looks like. They know what it feels like because they battled in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's what impeachable offense evidence looks like. Ask yourself, ask yourself, what does my vote for the sham inquiry do to their sacrifice? You know, it's incredible. 197 Republicans voted against impeaching Trump for an insurrection that they witnessed and experienced firsthand as they ran for cover or barricaded themselves in their office. But now, they're going to be okay with continuing an impeachment investigation into Biden when a deluge of evidence shows there's no wrongdoing. Are you kidding me? On January 6th, Trump and the insurrectionists failed to overturn the election. The evidence of that day led to a bipartisan impeachment in the House, 57 senators voting to convict in the Senate, and a historic criminal felony indictment of President Trump. What we, the Republicans have done by bringing this inquiry is to highlight for every American to see two visions, two visions of what leadership for the greatest democracy in history looks like. The extreme MAGA Republicans vision is that they must do all they can to bring back to power a president who brags about becoming a dictator. A president who conspired and then organized a violent mob to disrupt one of our most sacred democratic traditions, the peaceful transfer of power. A president, Trump, who desperately tries to punish his political enemies without any evidence of wrongdoing. Our democratic vision, and that of President Biden, is that no person is above the law. Our vision is of an American that respects the independence of the police, the courts, and our nation's justice system. Our vision 
is of a Congress that fights to make our communities better rather than using our power and our precious time in this chamber for vengeance and to sow chaos. The differences could not be more clear. Democrats impeached the president because he tried to overturn an election and destroy our democracy. Extreme MAGA Republicans are pursuing impeachment as political revenge because a man with 91 felony charges is telling them to do so. We heard the statements and quotes that our ranking member said, but there are so many more of President Trump's vengeance and his calls for revenge. I urge my colleagues to adopt this amendment so the record is clear that the evidence has been gathered and that evidence proves that there is no need to continue this time-consuming political theater. I yield back. Thank you. Is there any further discussion or debate on the amendment? The gentleman from Texas is recognized. I would note that we're here to talk about President Biden and an inquiry uh, re relative to President Biden. Um, one of the whereas clauses here in the amendment that is offered says, whereas in the 11 months since the Republican-led committee, committees, the Committee on Oversight and Accountability, the Committee on the Judiciary, the Committee on Ways and Means, first began their investigations. Republicans have received tens of thousands of pages, private bank records, Department of Treasury, National Archives, Federal, FBI, IRS documents, and dozens of hours of witness testimony, including Special Counsel Weiss and other high-ranking officials at the FBI, IRS, and the Department of Justice, attorney assigned to Hunter Biden's case. Well, I think what's important here, and we're not here to litigate the merits of impeachment, but to simply uh, proceed with a process for an impeachment inquiry for this body, the House of Representatives, to be able to conduct its oversight function uh, when we have seen an extraordinary amount of stonewalling, contrary to what the ranking members said, uh, out of this administration. Uh, consider, for example, um, with respect to the IRS, Biden's Department of Justice has prevented two tax division officials, um, Mark Daly and Jack Morgan, from testifying, despite subpoenas. Um, now, this is particularly concerning given the indictment of Hunter Biden just this past week. According to, these, uh, to the IRS whistleblowers, both Morgan and Daly were involved in the decisions to not charge Hunter Biden with some of his most egregious tax crimes. IRS whistleblower Shapley said in 2021 that Daly had agreed with recommendations in the report to charge Hunter Biden for crimes in tax years 2014 to 2019. In June 2022, however, Morgan and Daly reportedly gave a presentation on why DOJ should not, char not charge Hunter for the 2014 and 15 tax years. Well, that is particularly concerning, given the extent to which those have now been allowed to lapse with respect to the statute of limitations. Morgan and Daly also have firsthand information about David Weiss's authority to charge Hunter Biden outside of Delaware, which could potentially contradict previous statements Weiss has made. On June 29th of 2023, the committees requested transcribed interviews with 11 DOJ officials, including Morgan and Daly. DOJ declined the request and multiple further requests. On September 14th, 2023, House Judiciary Committee issued deposition subpoenas for both Daly and Morgan. However, Department of Justice stonewalled the committee once again. Daly's personal counsel said the Department of Justice directed him not to appear. On November, 20, on November 1st, 2023, <clears throat> House Judici Judiciary Committee issued a subpoena to Morgan that required his presence at a new deposition date. However, Morgan's personal counsel informed the committee that DOJ had directed him not to appear. <clears throat> now fast forward. December 7th, Hunter Biden's indicted. DOJ states, quote, a federal grand jury returned a nine-count indictment today charging Hunter Biden with three felony tax offenses and six misdemeanor tax offenses. According to the indictment, Hunter engaged in a four-year scheme in which he chose not to pay at least $1.4 million in self-assessed federal taxes he owed for tax years 2016 to 2019 and to evade the assessment of taxes for tax years 2018 when he filed false returns. Okay. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle want us to believe that that's some standalone problem for the president's son. But here's the problem. Four months ago, 
the same David Weiss that we're talking about tried to bury the tax case against Hunter Biden. That's what happened. Um, at that point, offering a uh, no jail plea agreement um, on two relatively unimportant misdemeanors. Uh, basically, a deal, uh, pretty much out of the ordinary. And the problem with that is, is that now suddenly, Weiss has moved a different direction because a judge called it the deal out. Um, he couldn't rationalize the plea bargain deal that he gave Hunter, and now he's making the case in the very indictment that he just put forward. The fact of the matter is there's been an extraordinary amount of stonewalling. This is one example of dozens that we could get into. And this is why the inquiry matters. This is why we should proceed with the inquiry. There are other issues that we could get into and raise, but to dismiss it and, and to just put aside and say there's been all of these investigations and there's been no issues that have been raised is just completely contrary to what anybody with eyes reading news accounts of what has occurred and looking at the indictment that was presented last week would understand. I yield back to the chairman. Mr. Chairman, the gentleman's recognized. Appreciate the gentleman engaging. Um, but uh, let's be honest, uh, we're here because Donald Trump asked you, no, demanded that you be here today to bring this inquiry forward. That is, that is why we're here. Dozens and dozens of Republicans, and even Fox News hosts, let that sink in, have bluntly admitted that there's no evidence to support impeaching President Biden and have instead lamented that pursuing impeachment is not good for the country. Uh, over the course of this year-long fishing expedition, because this is not beginning today, we've been doing this for over a year, um, uh, House Republicans have poured over tens of thousands of pages of documents and financial rec records uh, provided by the administration, have interviewed witnesses for dozens and dozens of hours, yet uh, they, nothing, nothing they have revealed has supported their wild conspiracy theories uh, and debunked uh, you know, the uh, allegations. Nevertheless, here we, here we are. But I think it's important uh, to, uh, to point out that, uh, that this is a waste of time. I'm gonna give you the words of, of Republicans. Don't take my word for it. Speaker Mike Johnson reportedly told his own colleagues, quote, that there is insufficient evidence to initiate formal impeachment proceedings. Rep. Mike McCall admitted, we don't have the evidence, that's his quote. Ken Buck, our colleague, the evidence for impeachment doesn't exist right now. He also said, I haven't seen any evidence linking Hunter Biden's activities to Joe Biden. That I'm not convinced that the evidence exists. Uh, Rep. Dusty Johnson said, there's a constitutional legal test that you have to meet with evidence when it comes to impeachment, but, but he has not seen that evidence. John Curtis, my bar for impeachment is incredibly high. For me, it's all about is there an impeachable offense and is there evidence of an impeachable offense? And when asked if he had seen anything that comes close to that bar, his answer was, quote, no. Daryl Issa, the former House Oversight Chair, said the actual uh, participation by the, vice, by the Vice President, now President, that still has to be discovered and, and or nailed down. Uh, Lisa McLean, when asked if the House Republicans, after nearly a year of investigation, had uncovered any improperly influenced policy decisions by President Biden, said, quote, the short answer is no. I mean, I have, I mean, I, I, I could be here all day reading quotes from your colleagues, Republicans, who basically have publicly admitted this is a waste of time after a year, after a year. So let's, let's be honest, we are here because Donald Trump said, ordered you to be here. He wants to finish the job. We're not here because there's any smoke. Uh, we're, we're, we're here uh, basically because this is what the former disgraced president wants from you. Uh, and with that, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a several pages of recent Republican quotes basically saying this is a no evidence and a waste of time. Without objection. For any further discussion of the amendment, the gentleman from Colorado is recognized. I thank the chairman. You know, the gentleman talked about stonewalling. I want to read him a quote. Quote, finally, allegations of obstruction ignore historic questions of privilege, ongoing litigation on the matter, and the fact that many executive branch witnesses testified. Democrats cannot complain about lack of participation when they created an environment 
that made testifying untenable. The American people will have the opportunity to decide in November 2020. We should let them, end quote. I suspect the gentleman recognizes that quote. Those are his words when he voted against impeachment of President Trump in 2019. So let's not pretend that this is not anything but the farce that it is. I understand the gentleman's position regarding President Biden, but the notion that this has any semblance of credibility or legitimacy is bellied by the facts. And I, I, while I would hope that my colleagues would apply some coherent consistency <laughs> with respect to their views on impeachment, I'm not expecting that. But I, I, one thing that I, I certainly don't believe the American people can countenance is the notion that somehow this process is a fair one or a transparent one or an open one or a necessary one. Uh, Mr. Uh, and that I would yield uh, to my colleague from New Mexico, please. Thank you very much. And I think that in response to this, the very fact that there is an indictment of Hunter Biden shows that President Biden and President Biden's Department of Justice stood back. And I think it's important to actually remember that Attorney General Garden, Garland recently reiterated his basic truth about this case. And he said, I promised the Senate when I came before it for confirmation that I would leave Mr. Rice in place and that I would not interfere with his investigation. And I have kept that promise. He also testified that there had been no contact with the president or the White House about the Hunter Biden matter. So all that you are doing over there of saying something has happened with Hunter Biden and we must raise it and this, we must have more and more and more documents. Oh my God, almost 100,000 pages of documents already and you can't find a leak? Because we need to remember that this is about whether or not President Biden has done anything in the last three years. It's not about his son's actions. Just as the impeachment of President Trump were about his conduct, and they weren't about how his kids or his son-in-law profited greatly from his presidency. They weren't about that three, $2 billion deal. They weren't about the money that those kids stole from a cancer charity. They were about what does President Trump do in office, not about his kids. And so this actually just proves the fact. So uh, with that, I'll yield back to my colleague. And, and I would uh, yeah, echo my colleague's remarks and would yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. The other thing that troubles me about this is that our colleague across the aisle has said that this has to happen because they're stonewalling. Stonewalling despite the tens of thousands of pages of evidence, the testimony by private individuals, et cetera. But he's ignoring the fact that this claim that these IRS folks have disclosed misconduct has been debunked by their own witnesses, by people from uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, by people from the Department of Justice, by people from the FBI, by agents from the IRS. He said these people were wrong, yet our colleagues across the aisle cling, cling to this misdirection and are using it to argue to their colleagues, oh, don't worry about it, this is just an inquiry. That's wrong. I mean, this is they, they have been given access to the evidence. They've been given unprecedented access to the evidence. Their own witnesses, their own documents have debunked the things that they are holding out there as evidence of some fictitious misconduct. So um, I yield back. And I yield back. Is there any further uh, comment or discussion of the amendment? 
A gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. You know, I think we just have to level set here. Um, we got to remember that we're here dealing with an inquiry. Uh, this has nothing to do with the former president. This has nothing to do with articles of impeachment. This resolution establishes nothing more than a process to follow the evidence and assert our Article I authorities. By the way, Article I authorities and Nancy Pelosi greatly reduced. But again, any talk that is outside of the process, outside of producing witnesses, outside of compelling compliance with subpoenas, for example, is irrelevant to the discussion. We're here simply talking about moving forward with the process. With that, I yield back. Any further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Recorded votes been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Cook. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rashenthaler. No. Mr. Rashenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose, aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Ms. Lizer Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Those have it. The amendment's not agreed to it. Are there additional amendments? Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk uh, will report. Amendment number three to House Resolution 918, offered by Ms. Scanlon. Before the resolve clause, insert the following. Whereas, in their investigation, the Republican majority has received 38,000 pages of financial records, including bank records for the personal accounts of members of the President's family and other private citizens, over 2,000 pages of Treasury Department reports, and tens of thousands of pages of records and emails from the National Archives from President Biden's service as Vice President. Whereas, Hunter Biden has offered to testify publicly under oath as part of the investigation. Whereas House committees have heard dozens of hours of testimony from Hunter Biden's business partners and then Vice President Biden's financial advisor, three current U.S. attorneys and Department of Justice officials, and four current Federal Bureau of Investigation and Inter Internal Revenue Service supervisory special agents, and unprecedented testimony from Special Counsel David Weiss on an, on on an ongoing investigation. Whereas the FBI and Treasury Department have provided access to and briefings on highly sensitive law enforcement documents. Whereas the National Archives have produced 62,000 additional pages of then Vice President Biden's records this week. And in addition to the 20,000 pages already publicly available. And whereas at the end of June, Committee on Oversight and Accountability Chairman James Comer said in an interview, every subpoena that I have signed as chairman of the House Oversight Committee over the last five months we have gotten 100% of what we requested, whether it's with the FBI or with the banks or with Treasury. Now, therefore, be it. General Lady is recognized on her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since the stated purpose of launching this inquiry is the false claim that President Biden has stonewalled this sham investigation, the purpose of this amendment is to detail the unprecedented and extensive cooperation provided by the president, his family, and this administration, despite the absence of any constitutional basis for this sham political stunt. I want to remind everyone again what's really going on here. It's as simple as this. House Republicans have wasted the past year on a cheap political stunt. The people who send us to Washington do so with the belief that we will work to make their and their families' lives better. But as we've seen all year, the extremists who have put the House majority into a chokehold aren't interested in keeping up their end of the bargain. And now they've brought us here today to waste more of the American public's time and tax dollars on petty political vengeance. In case it isn't clear already, Constitutional scholars are not driving this impeachment inquiry, holding the, instead the former president's lackeys here in Congress are running the show, holding the floor hostage as they attempt to curry favor to obtain pardons or positions in a second Trump administration. Meanwhile, the rest of their conference seems content to sleepwalk into dictatorship. 
as they yield what remains of their consciences to the most extreme members of the Republican Party. My amendment would shine some light on this shameful process and expose it for what it really is, a circus and a farce cooked up to placate the disgrace, defeated, and twice impeached former president. You know, there's a term for what House Republicans have proposed with their resolution today to start an impeachment inquiry. It's called a kangaroo court, a court in which the principles of law and justice are disregarded or perverted to reach a predetermined conclusion. This is my favorite definition, a mob-operated tribunal that disregards or parodies existing principles of law. That's what we're dealing with here, a MAGA kangaroo court engaged in a desperate search for evidence to prop up a predetermined conclusion and in which they're willing to subvert both the truth and the Constitution in a naked political stunt. For the past year, President Biden and his administration and his family members, private citizens with no role in the government, unlike the former guy, they have shared tens of thousands of documents with this kangaroo inquisition, including emails, financial records, and Treasury Department reports. They've responded to extreme Republican requests, no matter how absurd. Chairman Comer of the Oversight Committee has admitted this himself, saying, every subpoena that I have signed over the last five months, we've gotten 100% of what we requested. Numerous individuals, including private citizens, U.S. attorneys, Department of Justice officials, a special counsel overseeing an ongoing investigation, and federal law enforcement agency agents have made themselves available for dozens of hours of testimony and interviews. Federal law enforcement officials have provided briefings and access to highly sensitive documents. The president's son has offered to testify publicly under oath in front of Congress and the country, an offer that the Republicans have rejected. Extreme Republicans will continue trying to muddy the waters, attempting to drag the president and the American people down a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and untruths to support the MAGA kangaroo court. But the public knows this is a sham. The fact is that Chairman Com Comer and the rest of the so-called investigators have seen everything. Their fundamental problem isn't a lack of evidence. They have mountains of evidence. Their problem is that none of it proves their baseless accusations, and they know it. They can't even look at us. Dozens and dozens of Republican members and even Fox News hosts have admitted on the record there's no evidence, and they know it. But instead of admitting that, Republican leadership has yielded to the blackmail of the MAGA mob and agreed to spend our last legislative days of the year wasting more time to prop up a floundering, dead-end investigation. And in doing so, they further their attempts to chip away at the legitimacy and core values of our country's institutions. The American people deserve better than this. I encourage all of my colleagues to support my amendment to shine transparency and truth onto this extreme, illegitimate stunt. I yield back. Bill Lady yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Yes. I, 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 I yield to the ranking member. I'm sorry. No, 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 okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. So, so again, I got a level set here. We got to remember that these documents that my colleagues are talking about that were produced, these weren't just freely given documents by the good graces of the Biden administration or the Biden family, rather. Those were those were given to uh, the House by whistleblowers. Whistleblowers, I might add, that had been vilified by the far left Democratic extremists. In the bank records, th these bank records weren't freely given by the Biden administration. They weren't even freely given by the banks. The banks received subpoenas, and that compelled the production of the bank records. So if they're, again, we're talking about a process here. There should be, if there's nothing to hide, why not just go through the process? Why not just have this so we can compel the uh, production of documents, so we can compel the testimony of witnesses and force some depositions? If there's nothing to hide, there should be no issue with following the process. So again, I, I want to level set and, and just set the stage for why we need these documents. And again, these what we have received has not been freely given. With that, I yield back. 
The gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion yeah. or debate? This, this uh, ranking member. President, I want to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record uh, two different letters, one from the Trump White House and one from the Biden White House. You know, we hear uh, a lot about uh, stonewalling. I mean, this is the cooperation has really been unprecedented. But uh, let me just read one excerpt from the. This was in response to the inquiry regarding President Trump. Their response, White House's response uh, to uh, Congress was, given that your inquiry lacks any legitimate constitutional foundation, any pretense of fairness, or even the most elementary due process protections, the, exec the executive branch cannot in it be expected to participate in it. Uh, consistent with the duties of the President of the United States, and in particular, his obligation to uh, preserve the rights of future occupants of his office, President Trump, Trump cannot permit his administration to participate uh, in this partisan inquiry under any circumstances. Now, we're going to contrast that with the, the, the response that uh, Mr. Comer and Mr. Jordan received from this White House, uh, again, with, uh, basically saying we believe in en engaging good faith is critical to avoid constitutional conflict, and we propose a meeting with your staff to start this important process. Given the uh, compressed timeline created by your waiting nearly three weeks to respond to our prior letter, we expect that you will uh, put down the return date for your subpoena to allow accommodation uh, uh, process to proceed. Basically, it's it's a tale of, of two approaches. One administration that wants to uh, st stonewall, that was Trump, and then this administration that has cooperated. Not objection. But I just want to close with this. I, this is breaking news for everybody. So our, our, our Republican colleague, Don Bacon, uh, just a few minutes ago told a small group of reporters uh, this morning that there are, quote, probably not high crimes or misdemeanors that Joe Biden has committed. Yet he still plans to vote to authorize this impeachment inquiry, notwithstanding that there's no there there. Um, I guess the question is, when are people going to stand up and end this extreme political stunt? This is not the beginning of something. Uh, this should be the end of something. We've been doing this for over a year, uh, and there is nothing there. There's no smoke. Uh, and so this is a colossal waste of time. I yield back. Mr. The gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Chair. The gentlelady from New uh, Mexico is recognized. Just in response to the idea that this is about creating a process, I just want to reiterate what both the ranking member has said, what well, Representative Scanlon has laid out in detail, a process has been ongoing. Subpoenas were issued. Subpoenas were responded to. Documents were provided. They were provided in many different ways. And that is indeed a process. There is no evidence of anything but that, as pointed out earlier, President Biden's a good father. President Biden fought corruption. President Biden uh, was not involved in Joe or Hunter Biden's business dealings. That's what the documents have proven. What this process is, is keeping this story alive, is keeping Congress involved and uh, uh, distracted uh, by this impeachment idea, conspiracy thought, you know, thought process, because it's, it's like coming from above, because there is no document. We already have a process that we followed. And the idea that this is just about a process, we need to look at, use maps. Uh, Chairman Comer actually said, I'd indict tomorrow before they even began this process. They were talking about impeaching. They were not waiting for a process. And uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I would uh, um, I would yield to uh, my colleague. Gentlemen's yeah. recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Mr. President Van Bacon. I couldn't agree more. Again, perhaps the most frustrating element of this exercise is the intellectual dishonesty to pretend that this is anything but a fait accompli. There isn't a single one of you who's going to vote against impeachment if articles are brought to the floor four weeks from now, eight weeks from now, 12 weeks from now. So pretending as though this is just somehow a very simple step forward to approve a perfunctory or cursory process is not level setting with the American people. It is one of the most solemn votes that any of you will take in your careers. I suspect none of you have voted in the past to initiate an impeachment inquiry. So treating it in this cursory way, uh, as the gentleman from Pennsylvania uh, apparently wants the American people to believe, as I said, is inconsistent with the constitutional nature of impeachment, 
the weightiness of impeachment and proceeding on this course. And I would hope it would give some of you some pause. It's clear that that hasn't been the case. I yield back to the gentleman. And thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. General Lady yields back. Is there any further discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. General Lady uh, from Minnesota is recognized. And Mr. Chair, I would yield to my colleague from I'd like to thank my good friend. Again, just a level set, we're here talking about a process. And it's one thing to cherry pick lines from either this White, White House or the last uh, administration. But at the end of the day, we're here protecting our Article I uh, authority. And we're here largely because the Biden administration lawyers are saying they don't have to, they, they don't have to uh, face the subpoenas, they don't have to compel this evidence because we haven't had this vote. So. They're, they're the ones that are saying we don't have to be here. We are trying to set this up so that we can get all the evidence and have this. But again, this is about the process, and this is about, absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry. Ms. Of course, I didn't hear much about Article I authorities from you or any of my colleagues in the Judiciary Committee. You were there with me. Yeah, I w and uh, I yielded time that wasn't mine. Sure. So, so I apologize to my colleague. Uh, here's the thing, that once the rules have been changed, the rules are changed. So now you can't say that what was good enough for President Trump is no longer good enough for President Biden. So the Democrats shifted the standard. Frankly, now impeachment, you could view it as almost a political exercise. We're moving forward any time you have a president of a different party than the House, there's going to be calls from whatever base it is, whether it's Democratic base or Republican base, because of that. But that's not the Republican standard. That was the standard that was set by the Democrats uh, in the last administration twice. But again, this is about our Article I authority. This is about making sure that we have this vote because the Biden administration is saying they don't have to produce the documents or compel witnesses to testify in, in depositions because we haven't had this vote. And with that, I, the general lady has been very generous with her time. I yield back. General Lady yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Yeah, I would just, I would just note that again on, on the merits, right? I mean, there's going to be a lot of back and forth about you know, who did when and different circumstances. But on the merits, the question here isn't about production of documents. Anybody who's ever been involved with subpoenas and presentation of documents knows that document dumps are fairly normal. The question is, is what is actually being presented? What is being shared? Um, the Oversight Committee has identified 82,000 pseudonym communications that could, and this is the whole point of an investigation, contain key evidence uh, for which they've only received 14 documents. These are the questions about the pseudonym emails uh, and uh, that have been identified, 29,000 of which are between the office of the vice president and the family's business. So for those of us who are concerned about the flow of international dollars into the Biden family, which is hard to even dispute based on the indictment that is now sitting before us with respect to Hunter and where he's gone with his tax records, but importantly, what we know from other evidence about the extent of the millions of dollars flowing into the Biden family, Hunter and other members of the family. The question is, is, well, what did the vice president know when he was vice president? What did the president know? What did he know between those times? That's the point of the investigation. Again, we have 82,000 pseudonym communications, 29,000 between the office of the vice president and these family businesses, and yet we only have 14 of those produced. We still have the subpoenas outstanding for Mark Daly and Jack Morgan that I alluded to before that are not being responded to. The reason is, is because those go to the heart of the problem. Those get to the heart of the question. So the point here, and with respect to previous quotes and so forth, the quote that the gentleman was referring to was my conclusion at the end after the inquiry is my conclusion about that point is said with respect to the articles. My, my point here is with respect to an inquiry, and, and look, again, none of us are perfect to go through this. I, went, I just went back and reread the op-ed I wrote on December 11th, 2019, in which I concluded not to uh, support the impeachment articles. But notably, I presented that I did not think the phone call was perfect. I did think there were issues that merited looking into when I was sitting before all of that to make sure we understood exactly what the communications were. The point is we should pursue all of the facts wherever they may lead. 
as the, as the body in Article 1 that is supposed to be checking Article 2. And in this instance, what we're looking at here are very important, unresponded to queries by this branch, Oversight and Judiciary and others, to the administration. Again, what are we concerned about? What are we afraid about learning from Daly or Morgan? Why do we not want to make sure that Daly and Morgan come forth and testify? Why would that be concerning? Why do we not want to have those emails that are uh, potentially pseudonym emails, as we understand it, in terms of the communications between the office of the vice president and the family businesses, when we're talking about millions of dollars flowing from international sources with all sorts of connections with people who have testified on the record, Devin Archer and others, about where the president was and the president's knowledge of the existence of these family businesses and what he and the fact that they were selling, quote, the brand. There is significant amount of evidence that has come forward that raises questions that this body should want to know the truth about. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, yeah. I, I think I need a decoder ring to follow what the gentleman was just saying. I mean, look, an unprecedented amount of cooperation from this administration. Uh, National Archives has, has uh, listed uh, the, the number of documents that have been turned over that have been asked for. Chairman Comer said, uh, every subpoena that I have signed as chairman of the House Oversight Committee over the last five months, we've gotten 100% of what we requested, whether it's with the FBI or with the bank or with the Treasury. That's, that's Chairman Comer, the guy who said that he would vote to indict uh, uh, Joe Biden on day one before he's seen any evidence. Um, and I want, I want to thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania who's no longer with us for his honesty uh, when he basically said that this is a political exercise. So he is absolutely correct. This is a political exercise, pure and simple. Uh, you can try to dress it up all you want, but that's what this is. Um, and I appreciate and I want to thank him for his honesty. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Um, just in defense of the gentleman who's not here, what he said, I believe, is that the standard was lowered by the other side of the aisle to a political exercise. And um, I just want, for the record, since he's not here to defend what he saw, what he said, wanted to set that straight. Appreciate that. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Chen, I, <clears throat> I think it's, it's really humorous, the fever that I see from the other side, um, to continually bring up Donald Trump. This is about Joe Biden. And to put, a, put some, um, some context to the money we're talking about, uh, from 2014 to 2019, Biden family members and their affiliate companies received over 15 million from foreign companies and foreign nationals to Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, Romania, and China. Bet Biden business associates received an additional 9 million. Uh, for the president's uh, contention that he didn't know anything about it, wasn't anywhere near Joe Biden, uh, his son's business dealings. Uh, Devin Archer, who was a longtime Biden associate, uh, described the Biden brand, as Chip noted, and how Hunter Biden placed Joe Biden on phone calls, including on speakerphone, 20 times with business associates. And, you know, for y'all to, to just want to water this down and say it's nothing, what are you scared of? What are you scared of the fact? Uh, this is an inquiry that's going to go. It should have started. You're right. It should have gone far longer than this. How many happened under Nancy Pelosi? Zero. We took over in January. I think uh, Kevin put this, the, uh, the date is uh, September 13th or 14th to do the special inquiry. These are facts. These aren't small things. There's got to be consequences for this guy. Um, so Mr. it's would a... The, would the gentleman yield? Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you so very much. Uh, you know, and I, th I think that pointing out uh, those comments from... Uh, Mr. Archer is really important because we actually have the transcript and I'll address that later. But if you actually look at that transcript, Mr. Archer is very clear that while the father may have talked to his son, they never ever talked about business. They never ever talked about financial matters. And in contrast, when we are looking at issues about uh, family business, uh, I would like uh, to enter into the record, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you consent to enter into the record, a uh, political fact say that says
says, Trump taxes show foreign income for more than a dozen countries. And I think this... Without objection. I, I think that it is important. You are making a big deal of the fact that Joe, uh, that Joe Biden, as a private citizen, uh, a lot of these things that you're talking about happened when Joe Biden was a private citizen. But more importantly, that his brother and his son were separate. They did not have, that. Their, their businesses were not commingled. It's very clear from the evidence that they were separate. They were not the same. In contrast, <coughs> we know from this article uh, that says that Trump tax to show foreign income, Donald Trump's tax returns show the former president received income from more than a dozen countries during his time in office, highlighting a string of potential conflicts of interest it took a lengthy legal fight to be able to get those documents, and it included money from the United uh, Arab Emirates, from China. There was a lot of money made by Trump because Trump, President Trump kept ownership of those businesses. So I think it's really important to make the distinction that yes, Joe Biden has a brother and has a son and they have businesses, but that is not Joe Biden's business. And that is the key here. We are looking at what did the president do as president in contrast to what President Trump did, which was get a whole lot of money, tell a whole bunch of people, you better book your hotel stays at my, you know, my property while he was president. That is the contrast of what we're dealing with. And with that, thank you so much for yielding uh, the time. Sure, uh, Ms. Lega Fernandez, he, here's the difference. You've got a businessman that made his money long before he got into politics. What these facts or what we will find out is, and try to figure out, uh, what service did the Bidens provide? What expert was Hunter to get the 24 million and the rest of the family members? That's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. Uh, he's no businessman, he's a politician. That, and let's let the money trail follow and try to figure out, like his paintings, where did they come from? Where did the money come from? Let's, let's follow the trail. This is a joke, uh, if it wasn't so serious, with the money that this man apparently had. And he's, from day one, didn't know anything about it, never uh, had, had any uh, involvement. He's on phone calls. How about the pseudonyms? Where that, what is that? I think, in time, what y'all are trying to do is stall and prevent any information, more information from coming out. And the American people deserve better. And if, it's, if he's innocent, as he says he is, let the facts show it. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, just briefly. The gentleman uh, yeah. recognized. Well, I, I just want to say to the gentleman, um, you, know, uh, I, I, you just read from the Republican leadership talking points that went out. I will assure him that almost everything he has said has been disproven or discredited already. We're happy to share that with him. But when he said that this is not about, not about Donald Trump, I, I, I strongly disagree. Again, this is Donald Trump's quote, either impeach the bums or fade into oblivion. And unfortunately, my Republican colleagues are so fearful of him, are so afraid of him, that they do whatever he asks them to do. That is why we are here. We are here because of Donald Trump. We are here because the insurrection did not succeed on January 6th, and this is about finishing the job. So let's not kid ourselves that Donald Trump doesn't play a role here. I yield to the gentleman. I, I would completely agree with the ranking member. USA Today, this is from right. last week, December from December 4th, USA Today. Quote, if Trump, <coughs> who has been impeached twice, is the 2024 Republican nominee, Rep. Troy Nails said he wants to give Trump, quote, a little bit of ammo to fire back, end quote, and say Biden has also been impeached, end quote. So <coughs> the suggestion by the gentleman from South Carolina, by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, that this has nothing to do with Donald Trump is divorced from reality. You know it, we know it, the American people know it. This is being done at the behest of former President Trump. Why? Because he remains singularly focused on exacting retribution for being impeached in a bipartisan manner for his actions on January 6th. That's it. The rest of this is theater. I yield back my time. I think I yield back. Is there a further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. 
Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The gentlelady has requested uh, a vote. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Aye. Mr. Nagoose, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any uh, further amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Gentleman uh, from Colorado is recognized. The clerk will report the resolution. Amendment number four to House Resolution 918, offered by Mr. Nagoose. Page two, line seven, strike investigative and insert the following open and transparent investigative. Page six, line one, strike investigative and insert the following open and transparent investigative. Page nine, line 19. Strike investigative and insert the following. Open and transparent investigative. The gentleman's recognized on his amendment. I think the chairman, uh, I hesitate to belabor the arguments I've made already regarding what I consider to be and what I think the American mm -hmm. people would find to be a baseless impeachment process that Republicans have initiated. <coughs> it's a political stunt. The American people know that to be the case. They know that because there's been no cogent articulation by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle as to what crime they're actually investigating, no <coughs> connection to the constitutional standard for impeachment. But one of the other reasons they know this to be true is because of the sham process that Republicans have initiated. And this amendment seeks to at least rectify that glaring defect. And while this amendment course, has an audience of the entire committee, it, it perhaps has an even more targeted audience of one or two of my friends on the other side of the aisle who have spoken in the past about transparency, and I'm hoping maybe Mr. Massey or Mr. Roy might engage me in a colloquy about the merits of this particular amendment. It's very simple. Thus far, Republicans have engaged in a process that's been largely behind closed doors. Ms. Ledger Fernandez recounted this in great detail, the fact that so many of the interview transcripts have been hidden from the public. Uh, the fact that witnesses who have sought to testify in public, including the president's son, uh, have uh, been impeded by the committee from doing so. We went back and looked that the, the resolution that initiated the impeachment inquiry into former President Donald Trump is very similar in terms of the language that essentially Republicans have attempted to, to try to emulate different provisions of it. But there was one glaring omission, which is that in that resolution in 2019, prefaced behind every component paragraph that describes the investigation that the committees of jurisdiction would be engaged in, was a commitment to, quote, open and transparent investigative proceedings. Three words, open and transparent. Those three words were deleted by Republicans in this resolution. And so this amendment is very simple. It's very straightforward. It's not a gotcha amendment. There's no hidden door. It's simply asking my colleagues to add that phrase, open and transparent, to the resolution as a prefatory clause before the description of each investigative committee of jurisdiction. Because thus far, the process has been anything but. And so I, it makes sense to me why Republicans didn't include the, include the phrase open and transparent, because the process has not been open and transparent. So I, I don't think this was a, an accident. It wasn't an you know, error by omission. It was intentional. There's a great way for the Republicans, my colleagues, my friends on the other side of the aisle, to perhaps prove the contrary, which is to support this amendment. With that, uh, Mr. Would Chairman, you, would I, you I, gentlemen I'm yield? happy to uh, yield to the gentleman from Kentucky. Words are words, but the problem is I served on the oversight committee when the Democrats did their inquiry, and that happened three floors underground 
in a skiff where nobody could bring their cell phones. I sat down there for hours. And what happened is the, there was no semblance of openness. Or you would be arrested and taken to jail if you tried to witness what, what was happening inside of that skiff for, for weeks. I sat down there with Ambassador Sondland. I sat down there with Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. There was no openness, no transparency, unless you count Adam Schiff running out every time he got a nugget of something that he could leak. And that is exactly how I witnessed that process. Was, was the gentleman on the Oversight Committee or the Intel Committee at the time? No, I was on Judiciary. So um, if, but you, I guess if you've been on either you, of those committees. You know, and I, I, I understand the argument you're making. I would say a couple things. First, the resolution, again, you all used it as the, you know, essentially took different provisions and modified them and so forth. The inquiry resolution was following that, those interviews, as I can best recollect, from back in October and September of 2019. The inquiry resolution that you all have essentially used as a template was after that. And essentially what the resolution then compelled, for example, HIPSI to do was to hold, require, shall hold public hearings and shall issue a report on its findings. Your resolution, and, and of course included that, that, that's why the open and transparent language is included. This resolution does the opposite. That's all I'm trying to figure out is why, why not say the oversight committee is going to have, quote, open and transparent proceedings. We're going to require them to hold a public hearing, and we're going to require them to issue a report. Why is it, why is the language permissive, and why has open and transparent been deleted? And I, it, it, this isn't a political argument. I'm, it's a good faith question. Which I answer with a question. Why were we in a skiff? For, yeah. for weeks. What I'm saying to you is these and resolutions. When the Democrats yeah, were investigating. I hear you. What I'm saying to you is this inquiry resolution and the inquiry resolution that was adopted at the end of October in 2019 are both taking place after 10 months, 11 months of process. You've described the what you, you know, contend are closed door hearings that HIPSI conducted, and interviews, excuse me, that they conducted. Obviously, you've heard us talk about closed door interviews that oversight has conducted. My point is that at the impeachment inquiry phase, when we took that vote, from then on, everything was public, which is why the resolution was structured as such. In this instance, Republicans have removed it, and it's clear that they don't intend to have a public process. That's, that's what I'm asking. Well, I suspect at some point the other side of the aisle will claim that uh, the information that's being publicly released has no business being in the public about bank records and things like that. So maybe it's an, it's an effort to respect the, the wishes of the other side. Oh, I'm yeah. sure that that's the reason, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Matthew. But I, but I, I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. I'm going to yield to the, the ranking member. I'll just simply say again, I, I don't, this is a good faith argument. It, it, it's not complicated adding open and transparent to make a commitment to the American people that you're actually gonna conduct a process that is open and transparent shouldn't be complicated, it shouldn't be difficult. And, I, and I, don't, I don't know why. I get it, I understand your opposition to some of the other amendments, including amendments that I'm going to offer, but uh, this really shouldn't be one of them. And I yield to the ranking member. No, I, I think I may have an answer for you. I, I'm reading USA Today. There's an article, um, House Republicans, uh, uh, you know, talk about how they, uh, omitted open and transparent from the resolution, and the, the excuse, uh, the rationale that uh, a Republican uh, aide gave was that uh, keeping open and transparent in uh, was wordy. Uh, I mean, I, 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 really, I mean, open and transparent, I mean, three words, too wordy? That's the excuse to uh, eliminate it? Uh, it's, it's laughable. I mean, this, this is ridiculous. I mean, again, uh, I think we all should agree that this should be open and transparent. Um, you know, it was in the previous uh, resolution when we were in, char in charge, let's, let's just put it in. I mean, that's a sign of good faith. Uh, but to say that it's being omitted because it's wordy, I mean, come on, give me a break. Uh, I yield back. I yield back. Or I yield to the gentleman. Oh. I don't know whose time it is, but I assume it's the chairman's time, so, so I appreciate it. Uh, 
look, again, I've got a just level set here. This this amendment literally does nothing other than change the wording of the, the subheader. I mean, and the ranking member just admitted that. I mean, we're here talking about changing investigative to open and transparent, investigative. Uh, that that's it. Uh, just to put this just to put this in perspective, I have the side by side compared to the one the comparative to the one sixteenth and the one eighteenth uh, resolution. Was and it? Yeah, why delete it? Why would you delete it? it? Because we have our our hearings have been in the open. They've been open and transparent. Well, you deliberately to begin with. And, deleted it. Why? And, and again, I was with what Mr. Massey was talking about. I was on judiciary. A lot of those meetings were in. In fact, most of them were in a skiff. And as Mr. Massey said, had we come out of that skiff and reported what was being said and conducted, we would have been arrested and gone to jail. We, our our process here has been absolutely open. It's been it, it's there's the public has been included, told it, as compared to what Speaker Pelosi did, where again we were three levels below ground in a, in a skiff. So I, I just I just don't think this is necessary. But just for the record, the gentleman does control the time. So. Okay, thanks. Gentlemen, you'll, I will, I'll yield. Yeah, I mean, I again. These words were deliberately deleted. And my friends keep on saying to us, it's not about Trump, it's not about Trump, it's not about Trump, but now it's about Trump. Uh, so uh, you can't have it both ways. But again, deliberately deleted the words open and transparent. Um, and, and with all due respect, the process that you're conducting right now, I don't believe is open and transparent. And by the way, I mean, I'm not, I'm not on the oversight committee either, but some things, you know, especially on the first impeachment were classified. Um, and um, there was a reason for some of that. But again, all we're asking for is the gentleman to put back in the words open and transparent. Uh, for some reason, Republicans deliberately removed it. None of us can figure out why, but uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. I yield, thank you for yielding. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, questions on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. 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 Those have it. Recorded vote's been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rashenthaler. No. Mr. Rashenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose, aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. No have it. The amendment's not agreed to. Uh, no additional amendment. Mr. Chair. The lady from New Mexico is recognized. Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number five to House Resolution 918, offered by Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Page two, line 14, strike may and insert the following, shall. Page six, line eight, strike may and insert the following, shall. Page 10, line two, strike may and insert the following, shall. General ladies recognized on her amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a follow-up to uh, the earlier amendment about the need for open and transparency in this process. But going to Mr. Rosenthal's talk is, how do we do that? And I think one of the ways we do that is require, not permit, but require that the committees hold open hearings. It's simple. We always hold open hearings. This hearing that we are engaged in right now is open, and the American public is able to see what we, our arguments are, is able to determine, well, does this make sense? What should we be doing? What is the evidence? We need that. Because right now, in the evidence that we, as Congress people, have been able to look, see, we know that there's clear and compelling evidence in the 100,000 pages of documents and the hours of testimony that President Biden was not involved in and did not profit from his brother or his son's business dealings. So in response to Mr. Norman's concerns about where does that evidence lead, the evidence in the record actually already shows that there was no connection. It's available, though, 
in closed uh, door hearings and transcripts, and meetings that are not easily accessible to the public. Extreme MAGA Republicans seem to want to do their work behind closed doors and in secret. My amendment would simply require that we hold open hearings. We need open hearings because for 11 months, we've seen Republicans on these investigating committees distort the evidence they've received behind closed doors, debunk, fact check, not true, distorted, mischaracterized, and misused. These are the terms that we keep seeing regarding the Republican statements about the record so far. Representatives Bober and Marjorie Taylor Greene are prime examples of misrepresenting the facts they hear behind closed doors. On July 31st, Representative Bober <coughs> tweeted, I quote, Devin Archer confirmed that the big guy participated in more than 20 of Hunter's shady business deals, close quote. That same day, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene told a reporter that Devin Archer said he heard Hunter Biden speak to his father 20 times about only their business dealings. The transcript, the transcript of what Archer actually said is that Archer told the committee that he did not, open quote, witness specific business deals or business dealings or specific about any kind of financial stuff, unquote between Hunter and his father. What did Archer say uh, Joe Biden actually talked to his son about on these calls? Mr. Uh, Norman might be very interested in this because what Archer actually says they talked about in those 20 calls is the weather, geography, how's the fishing? They were in Archer's terms, casual conversations. The news articles reporting these discrepancies say the transcription shows the opposite of what Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert claim. Something that is the opposite of the truth could be described as distortion or simply a lie. Una mentira, as we would say in Spanish, a lie. Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent to enter into the record the transcript of the Archer's testimony. From Without Biden. objection. And because it is a big document, the article titled Transcript of Devin Archer Testimony doesn't back key claims about Joe and Hunter Biden. Without objection. Chairman Comer, who has appeared before us and who I respect, has been leading the investigations into President Biden. Unfortunately, Chairman Comer has also misrepresented facts. Indeed, the Washington Post reported that Republican leaders exaggerate their partisan reports in the media to claim wrongdoing by President Biden. The Washington Post noted that Comer and other GOP lawmaker claims eventually lead to reporting that is, quote, untethered from the documentation in the report, unquote. Untethered. It means it's untethered from truth. It's untethered from what's actually in the report. The Washington Post uh, further noted that, open quote, Comer would have more credibility if he stuck to documented facts, close quote. Mr. Chairman, I request unanimous consent to enter into uh, the record the article titled, How Republicans Overhype the Findings of Their Hunter Biden Probe. Without objection. Republicans are hiding the facts and then lying to the public about them. There have been 11 months of investigation, almost all of which, has, of which has happened behind closed doors. And now they want to continue that investigation, continue those committee hearings in secret. What are they afraid of what the public's going to see? Maybe that there's no evidence of wrongdoing by President Biden and that this inquiry distracts from the important work Congress should be doing because Republicans continuously distort the facts to fit their preferred narrative. They've lost all credibility, as this newspaper article notes. Just a couple of weeks ago, Oversight Committee Republicans claimed that Hunter Biden received payments from Chinese companies and nefariously gave some to President <coughs> Biden. But then we found out that hadn't happened at all. We found out that Joe Biden had helped his son make his truck payments while Hunter was struggling with addiction and in and out of rehabilitation. In 2018, before Joe Biden even ran for president, Hunter repaid his father the sum of 
$4,140 for a truck payment. Now, Republicans are trying to turn this $4,140 worth of help during Hunter's time of struggling with addiction into an impeachable offense? A parent's love is never without pain. The pain of watching your child struggle with addiction is something that too many Americans know intimately, something my own mother knew as she lost two sons to this accursed affliction, but not before she tried to help them. What parent in America would stop loving their child because that child spiraled into addiction and needed help? Americans will see in Joe Biden's truck payments some of their own actions to help their struggling children. Shame on my Republican colleagues for trying to turn this fatherly love into an impeachable offense. Shame on their attempt to politicize a parent's pain and goodness. I urge my colleagues to adopt this amendment to require public hearings, and I yield back. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Pennsylvania is recognized. Okay, once again, just a level set. Here's some facts on transparency. So the Oversight Committee has already had four memos detailing the bank records. Of course, those have been open to the public. They've had two public hearings. They've also released full transcripts of those hearings to the public. Um, they've continued to, to update, not, not just Chairman Comer, but uh, Chairman Jordan, Chairman Smith have been on TV, they've been on print. You can't turn on a news program without seeing one of those three update the American people on this, so to say that, that we somehow lack transparency is laughable, especially when you compare it to the 116th, when even after the committee went forward with the impeachment inquiry vote, the Intel Committee continued to hold uh, hearings in a skiff. Um, again, so the transparency argument is laughable in the face of the 116th and in the actions of just the Oversight Committee. With that, I yield back. Is there additional uh, discussion on the amendment? Yeah, is it, I mean, we can, the we members can, recognize. We can talk about memos. I got a memo here that refutes, basically refutes everything the gentleman just said. But I have a question. When is when when are the uh, transcripts going to be made public and released uh, on the interviews? Does the gentleman know? That I don't know. Okay. Well, uh, maybe if you, maybe before the end of the hearing he could find out because again we talk about open and transparency. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Back. Oh, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized. Sure, I, I do think it's really important that this process, if it is to go forward, um, is open and transparent. We've I've already had personal experience with this process when David Weiss, special counsel, came in, sat for seven hours of interviews. Um, he offered to testify in public. That offer was rejected, and then we saw. Um, members of the judiciary come out and mischaracterize what, in fact, he had said in that interview. Mr. Rushenthaler is absolutely right. The three chairs of the committees conducting this sham impeachment inquiry have been all over the news, on Fox, on Newsmax, every night, mischaracterizing what they found, mischaracterizing what witnesses had said. And that's why it's important that if this is to go forward, the American people be able to judge for themselves. There's a pattern and practice at this point of the Republican majority hiding what's going on, only cherry picking the evidence that they want to move forward, disregarding when it's contradicted even by their own witnesses. And I think it's really important that we adopt the gentlewoman from New Mexico's amendment. Is there further discussion? The gentleman, the chair. The gentleman yeah, from- Just a quick observation that our, our Democrat, oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah. The gentleman from Texas recognized. Uh, that our, our Democrat colleagues in the uh, Judiciary Committee on which I serve, Oversight Committee, I'm informed, uh, are, are welcome to participate, do participate. Uh, Representative Goldman has participated uh, in the proceedings, are able to uh, see transcripts, are able to see the information in committees. Um, that stuff has all been uh, transparent and bipartisan within the committees. Um, the timing on how that gets released, that's you know up to the committees in that conversation as we go through the continued investigation. Um, then I also notice we're talking about you know people running to the press, you know, Quick Google just shows a week before the presidential debate in 2020, Adam Schiff going on and saying, quote, while we know that this whole smear on Joe Biden with respect to the Hunter Biden laptop, I might add, uh, comes from the Kremlin. 
Clearly, the origins of this whole smear are from the Kremlin. The president is only too happy to have the Kremlin help and try to amplify it. That's what the American people have seen in terms of show horses going to the Kremlin. I yield back. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. I thank the chairman, and uh, I suppose I'll pose the same question that I pose with respect to the amendment that I offered. I support Ms. Ledger Fernandez's amendment, and so, you know, for Mr. Roy or uh, for Mr. Massey or any of my friends on the other side of the aisle who care to, to opine on this, all this amendment does is simply say that the committee, the three committees of jurisdiction that you all have decided are the committees of jurisdiction for purposes of this impeachment inquiry, Ways and Means, Oversight, and Judiciary, that they shall hold public hearings. In prior impeachment inquiry resolutions that have been approved by this Congress on a bipartisan basis, the language has always been shall. The Congress has always decided that when you conduct an impeachment inquiry, that the committees be compelled to hold public hearings, that it's not permissive. Republicans, for some reason, decided to delete that language. The, the shall language has been deleted from this resolution and instead has been replaced with may, giving your chairman of those three committees the discretion to decide whether or not to hold a public hearing. And so I, I just don't, and Norman, if you care to, I mean, I, I, many of you have spoken in the past about transparency and the need for public disclosure and hearings. And I'm trying to understand why this amendment is objectionable to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And I've, yet, I've yet to hear a cogent answer as to why that is. And I, I, I'm not asking, you know, I, and Mr. Eschenthaler, if you care to, I, we can go back in time and you can, you know, go give the litany of examples from 2019. It's a simple question. The 2019 impeachment resolution compelled the committees of jurisdiction to hold public hearings. This resolution doesn't. And I'm just trying to figure out why. Thank you. Or anybody. I don't know. Well, I think one thing when you look at the shall and the may language, you got to remember that we're not dictating what the committees are going to do. We're giving them the option to follow the evidence, um, have the investigation, and then de determine whether or not they're going to publish a report at all. Uh, we don't think that we should micromanage these committees. As far as the openness and transparency, again, everything has been out in the open and transparent. Going, going back to the 116, we have to remember that even after the inquiry vote happened, the Democrats in that the committees were still holding hearings in skip, where you couldn't go out of the room and talk about what was happening, what happening, let alone the American people being able to watch. We've been very transparent now in the open. And lastly, you know, if you want to talk about the 116 and go back in time, you got to remember that this committee was given less than 24 hours notice uh, in the 116 of moving forward on the, the inquiry vote. Uh, we've been telegraphing this well in advance. We've been open and transparent, not only with the information, but also with the timing, and I yield back. And so I would just say to the gentleman, again, this is fairly straightforward and pretty simple, okay? The prior resolution, I used the 2019 impeachment as an example. The language is this. The chair of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence shall designate an open hearing or hearings pursuant to this section, okay? House Republicans replaced Intel Committee with oversight, understanding that your investigation is being conducted primarily through the Oversight Committee. And you deleted the phrase shall, and instead you put the phrase may. And my point, I, I don't think it's very complicated. I think most Americans who are watching, by the way, uh, Americans who may agree with you, I think they're a very, very small minority. I think most folks understand that this is a political stunt. But even in so far as, you know, Mr. Norman, you're making the case that you believe that there needs to be an investigation, that there need to be public hearings, why delete the language that requires a public hearing? I, wouldn't you want a public hearing? I don't understand why you, you deleted it. I'm going to go to Mr. Norman, because Mr. Resenthaler, I've, I've given you a couple opportunities. I always enjoy our colloquies, but I, I'm not getting much of an answer on this one, so I don't, maybe Mr. Norman might give me a... Well, you know, <clears throat> as far as the wordsmithing of it, may or shall, or... Here's it's a big difference. I get that. Here's what's going to happen. The results that's coming out of these committees, I don't dictate 
when the committees go in and what they do. You do. Just like resolution. Donald Trump doesn't dictate right. uh, what happens. All I know is the results will be transparent. And, and Ms. Gallen, I agree with you. Let's let the American people judge. And Ms. Uh, Ledger Fernandez, you bring up uh, Hunter's drug issues. Yes, everybody has problems. Uh, well, a lot of people have gone through the same thing. But everybody in America has to pay tax. Everybody has to account for money that they make. Everybody uh, should not get the deal that Hunter Biden was trying to get. And I'll comment, you mentioned that um, his business associate said that probably the President Biden was talking about the wind and the weather. Here's, what, here's the testimony from Devin Archer um, in one of the hearings testifying that people would be intimidated to mess with Burisma legally because of the Biden brand. During the trans transcribed interview with Devin Archie, he described the Biden, Biden brand as a value uh, to a company such as Burisma. Question, you keep saying brand, but by brand you mean the Biden family, uh, family, correct? Archer, correct. Question, and that brand is what, in your opinion, was a majority of what the value that was delivered from Hunter Biden to Burisma? Answer, I didn't say majority, but I wouldn't speculate on percentages. But I do think th that was an element of it. Mr. Biggs, when you say Biden family, sorry to cut you in here, I just wanted to get a clarification. You aren't talking about Dr. Jill or anybody else. You're talking about Joe Biden. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say. And this, I, that was the answer. I don't know any other clear way uh, to... To, to show and to be transparent, th this is testimony. And, and if you go back, uh, Mr. Goose, I mean, all the things that have been found and will, from what I understand, will be found, um, you can't erase LLCs. You can't, can't erase the pseudonyms that Congressman Roy talked about in the, the text and email. You can't erase that. You can't erase the checks. He's got bank statements or don't just drop out of the air and you can dispute it. So the transparency, I agree with. Uh, the, the fact of how it's being conducted and what will come out of it, I think the American people would judge. And the Biden family has gotten well, by Mr. long enough on this. Mr. Norman, I would, I, would I, yield, say, I yield to you. Uh, and I would say, uh, well, well, well it's I'll, I'll actually the gentleman <laughs> Colorado's time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I have, no, that's all right. Look, and I'm gonna give my colleague, uh, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, an opportunity to respond more substantively some of, some of your comments, but I would just simply say this. You keep on saying the American people have an opportunity to decide. They clearly will not under the process that you've designed. Just so, just so we're clear, absolutely clear, any Republican that votes for this resolution is voting for a process that would allow the Oversight Committee, the Judiciary Committee, and the Ways and Means Committee to conduct an impeachment inquiry entirely in secret. Entirely in secret. This resolution gives the chairs of those three committees the power to conduct every hearing in private. Every hearing. That's never been done before. The impeachment inquiry pro resolutions that we've approved, Republicans, you know, have obviously the vast majority of Republicans opposed them, but nonetheless, the impeachment inquiries that have been adopted have said that those committees shall conduct an open hearing. Doesn't mean every hearing that they conduct has to be in public. That's not what that language requires. It simply requires that they at least conduct a public hearing. And I'm not, I, I've yet to hear a cogent answer as to why Republicans want to give that power to their three chairmen to basically say, listen, you know what, conduct this witch hunt behind closed doors, do whatever you need to do. You don't need to conduct a single hearing in public for the American people to make up their own judgment. I, I think that's dangerous. And I, I just, I, you, and I don't really understand why. If you disagree with that, you could support this amendment that Ms. Ledger Fernandez that has offered that literally is three words that just takes, strikes the word may and puts shall in place of it, the same way that it, this has been done since time immemorial on impeachment inquiries. So you so yield I, that's for a all question? I I, I'll yield to for a question. Um, as one of my colleagues mentioned, uh, I was at the skiff one time when Adam Schiff was conducting it. And we had to basically break in. Had to, he had the doors shut. Was that um, open process in the skiff? 
Yeah. And with, with Adam Schiff making all these accusations. Okay. A couple things unfounded. I would say. A couple things I would say. So again, if you're using, let's say, the 2019 impeachment as 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 a template or as a corollary, right? There were interviews that were conducted in classified settings and closed door. There were hearings that were conducted in public, right? We all know that. And judiciary, I participated in numerous hearings with my colleague, Ms. Gershenthaler, and others in public. There were also interviews that were conducted uh, behind closed doors. So that, that's not, I'm not making the argument that the entire process is one in which it's it conducted all through open hearings. All I'm saying is that this resolution doesn't require any of the committees to hold a single public hearing. And I don't really understand why you're so resistant to saying, Chairman Comer, we're gonna start this inquiry, and during this process, you have to hold at least one hearing in public. That's a reasonable thing to ask of him. I would think the American people would expect that from Congress. Now, I, I'm not, again, I, I've, I've probably belabored this point, but I, it, it really, it is nonsensical to me that Republicans wouldn't just say, yeah, you know what, this is, this is a drafting error. Maybe it was a drafting error on your part, and we're gonna include shall, because these committees, when considering something as weighty as impeachment, they should hold at least one of their hearings in public. But the fact that you refuse to tells me it's not a drafting error, and that this was intentional. The same reason you deleted open and transparent from the resolution, that you've decided that you're gonna engage in a purely political process. And uh, I, I think- Would gentlemen yield? Of course, I would yield to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just make a quick point, and I don't usually like to interject myself in debate, but as my friend said, uh, you had open and transparent in the language last time, but not everything was in the open. And I, I'm not, you know, some of this was classified. I'm not, I'm not making any accusations then, but a lot of it was not in the open. Uh, in this case, particularly the ways and means, may well be dealing with tax returns that would not normally be public. We all know they have the authority to do that. There is some sensitivity about using those words. In the end, we decided we trust the discretion of our chairman. Uh, we think they will do open hearings at the appropriate time. But there was some pushback about using this language because there would be time when, frankly, to protect witnesses or folks that accusations might be made, they might be looking at material that you would not, none of us would want shared in the open. So uh, I don't know, that may not satisfy my friend, but I just interject that as an explanation well, I, as to what I would some say of the concern is. And again, uh, I, I do make the point, uh, and maybe that's just a different thought. We trust the chairman to do the right thing. Um, you know, you, you maybe had a stronger feeling about uh, you know, control from the center of it or making certain things. We just don't operate quite that way. I mean, again, we want these committees to operate independently. We trust the chairman to make the appropriate decision. So so I yield back to my friend. I thank him for yielding to me. I thank the chairman, uh, and I, I'll yield uh, to Ms. Fletcher for an answer. So, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I think that what we are trying to do with this amendment is not require that every single proceeding uh, be open. And I think that's key, so that when there are requirements for privacy, as you've just described, or when there are requirements uh, to protect nat national security, that can happen. But the idea that there shall be at least some public hearing, because precisely to the point that Mr. Norman is pointing out, that when you are, when you are sort of limited to reading through a transcript, you don't get what is very important, which is what about the credibility of the witness? We are going to be asked, and the American people is gonna be asked to judge these witnesses on their credibility. And we cannot see them testify before Congress. We cannot see them testify before the committee. We don't know about their credibility. We all know that we get so much of our information as we see each other, as we read each other. That is who we are as human beings, which is why when you are in a courtroom, when you are in a courtroom, the credibility of the witness is key 
And that cannot be a judge's decision about the credibility of a witness or a jury's decision about the credibility of the witness cannot be appealed because it is the person who watches that witness testify that makes that decision. And so this amendment that I've proposed allows what you're describing, Mr. Chair, which we recognize is important. It allows it. That's why we didn't say every single thing that, this commit, that these committees do shall be. It says they shall hold public hearings. So it's, it, it, it is permissive to allow for the circumstances because we think it is so important. We do think it is not something that you leave to the discretion of the chairman, that we say as the Rules Committee, as the United States House of Representatives undergoing this most solemn, as you described at the beginning, this most solemn of obligations, that we uphold our commitment to the American public that there shall be public hearings. And that was the intent of uh, the resolution as it was written precisely to accommodate your concerns. I yield back to my Sir, sure, further discussion or debate uh, on the uh, amendment? The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. I think the chairman, uh, I would just and echo the comments made by Ms. Ledger-Fernandez. I also want to say thank you to the chairman for providing clarity, uh, at least to me, in terms of some of the rationale behind the selection of the language, because that, that's really what I was trying to get at and was unable to discern why that decision was made. And what I would simply say is, I think Ms. Ledger-Fernandez captured this right, that the shall language is actually permissive. I think it accomplishes what, Mr. Chairman, you and the, the relevant committee chairs were seeking to accomplish in terms of requiring a public hearing, but also providing the committee with the ability to conduct the necessary hearings that they believe are necessary um, in a closed setting. And I would just caution and perhaps you know, beg your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, as you know, and as Mr. Reschenthaler has made the case before, that you know, every action we take sets a precedent that then becomes a precedent for future Congresses. And walking away from this shall language, walking away from the open and transparent language, I mean, by the way, we, don't, we didn't do an amendment, but the shall language was removed from the recording as well. So, I mean, that's an important point for Mr. Norman, you know, Mr. Roy, others, for you all to, I, I'm sure you glean this from your review of the resolution. And it's the, the resolution that, the last impeachment inquiry resolution that was adopted by the Congress had language that requires each of these committees after they conduct a public hearing, which is required under the prior resolution, to issue a report, that they shall issue a report. Not the case in your resolution. It's may issue a report. So I, there, there's no requirement that any of these committees, uh, after they conduct this impeachment inquiry that uh, you all um, you know, are very fixated on pursuing, that they issue any report. Not a requirement under the Republican resolution. Uh, I'm not sure why. I don't know if that's because you believe if the committees don't find impeachable conduct that you don't want the committees to issue a report that the American people can review for themselves and decide. I can tell you that in prior impeachments, that's been a requirement so that at the end of the day, the committees can follow the facts and whether they conclude that there is in fact an impeachable offense or they conclude that there's not, they're required to issue a report by the Congress that they share with the American people. You all have chosen to make that permissive. Or, excuse me, not permissive. You've chosen to essentially make it an optional for the committee, just like public hearings are now optional for the committee, just like in an open and transparent process, it's optional for the committees. And so I, I don't, I, I would simply ask you to reconsider and perhaps give some pause to that. This language here is not, it's, it is not a gotcha. It's just using standard language that's been used time and time before. Is there any additional discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Chair, Gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized. Thanks for yielding me the time. I appreciate it. So to answer my friend from Colorado, um, look, the reason we have shall instead of may, we got to remember why there was shall language in the 116. That's because Chairman Schiff wanted to do everything behind closed doors with Schiff. So Speaker Pelosi had to change language from may to shall to compel him to have this out in the open. We don't, that's the historical reason why the language was, was shall instead of may, if you go back to the 116. We don't have that problem here because we've done everything out in the open. 
I, I just read a stat of how many hearings have been public, how many transcripts have, have been released, uh, et cetera. And then as far as the, the shall language on issuing a report, we, we do not dictate a result to the committees uh, that are investigating this. If there's nothing to report, then there's nothing to report. Frankly, you can make an argument that, unlike the Mueller investigation, the airing of dirty laundry shouldn't have happened because there was a de decision not to proceed. Now, I think the Democrats have changed the standards, so I like the idea that we do uh, that we do an inquiry and we release everything, whether or not there's a decision to actually impeach or not. Just again, I don't like that standard, but that's a standard that was set by by Mueller, and um, it goes in the face of prosecutorial ethics um, and, and, and uh, ways of conduct. But again, you change the standards, so we should be able to air the dirty laundry. But that's up to the committee chairs. We're not going to dictate to our committee chairs and predetermine an outcome. So that is why there's the, the difference here, and we're saying may instead of shall. With that, I, I yield back to the gentlewoman from Minnesota. General lady yields back. Any further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Uh, vote, a roll call for members requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. No. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Aye. Mr. Nagoose, aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. And the noes have it. Uh, I need to interrupt at this point to advise the committee that the Rules Committee has business on the floor. So we will uh, be recessing and we'll uh, return at the beginning of the last vote series, after the last, the last vote uh, is cast in the floor and resume the hearing at that point. So with that, the committee stands in recess.
Committee will uh, reconvene. Can the lady have an amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the uh, amendment. Amendment number six to House Resolution 918, offered by Ms. Scanlon. At the end of the resolution, at, at the end of the resolution, the following. Section seven, limitation on subpoena authority. Notwithstanding clause 2M of rule 11, a chair or ranking minority member of a committee or select committee of the House of Representatives, if such chair or ranking minority member did not comply with a subpoena duly issued by the House of Representatives, a committee of the House of Representatives or a select committee of the House of Rep Representatives is not authorized to issue a subpoena, one, pursuant to this resolution, or two, in furtherance of the impeachment inquiry described in the first section of this resolution. The uh, gentlelady is recognized on her amendment. Thank you. Uh, my amendment would make clear that members of this body who have defied a congressional subpoena are not entitled to enforce a subpoena for the purposes of this inquiry. This should be common sense. Uh, troublingly, we have Republican members of this body who have thumbed their noses at congressional subpoenas. The chairman of the Judiciary Committee, one of the three committees directed to carry out this baseless investigation, was issued a subpoena last year by the bipartisan January 6th Select Committee to testify concerning what he knew about the planning and execution of the various attempts to overturn the 2020 election, the January 6th attack on the Capitol, and the former president's uh, response and activities in response to that attack on the Capitol. Uh, but he willfully defied that subpoena and failed to appear for his scheduled depositions multiple times. Now, um, out of compliance with Congress himself, he's being asked to wield subpoena power as an act of petty political vengeance. Uh, these are not credible actors. This is not a credible investigation. It's a farce. It's a kangaroo court all to satisfy the four times indicted, twice impeached, and unelected former president's ego. And as we've seen for years, our extreme Republican colleagues are more than happy to cave to Trump's demands of retribution against his political rivals in a desperate attempt to help him in the polls. So refusing to cooperate with a congressional subpoena, especially as a member of this body, a body where we've heard argument today about the duty to enforce Article I authority is just another example of our extremist colleagues' disregard for the rule of law and our American institutions. So we as members of Congress shouldn't be, let it stand, and I would urge adoption of my amendment. Gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. I request a vote. Uh, roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mrs. Fishbach. Mr. Massey. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Neguse. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Uh, and the no. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see a gentleman come in. Uh, how's the gentleman from Colorado recorded? The gentleman is not recorded. Mr. Neguse, aye. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, six nays. And the noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. Any further amendments? Is there, uh, Chairman, I have an amendment, amendment number seven. Gentleman's recognized. Oh, excuse me. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number seven to House Resolution 918, offered by Mr. McGovern. Strike section six. Gentleman's recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this impeachment inquiry resolution deems as passed a second resolution regarding the enforcement of subpoenas in court, including potentially dragging two nonpartisan career prosecutors to court 
when their supervisor already participated in a transcribed interview. And my amendment doesn't even stop you from doing that. All I'm saying is that rather than deeming this resolution, let's consider it separately on the floor and let the House decide. Let's just recap for those just tuning in uh, what happened right before this committee went into recess. Democrats brought up an amendment to insert words open and transparent um, into, Republican, into the Republicans' impeachment resolution. You all voted no. Democrats brought up an amendment to require at least one public hearing uh, on impeachment. My friends voted no. Uh, I asked when the transcripts of their behind closed doors interviews would be released. Uh, they told us they'd have to get back to us. And I think uh, what's going on here is pretty clear. Uh, they're against transparency because this whole exercise is built on Republicans going on Fox News and mischaracterizing, let's be honest, lying about the evidence. They interview someone in private who says President Biden did nothing wrong. Uh, then they go on Fox News and literally, literally say the opposite. I'll give you an example. My friend from Texas, Mr. Roy, keeps harping on the need to bring in two career prosecutors mm -hmm. who I'm not going to reference by name because they're getting death threats. But what he doesn't tell you is that Republicans already dragged in their boss to testify before the Judiciary Committee on October 25th. And his testimony totally undercuts and debunks all of the absurd claims that my colleague from Texas keeps making. Now, I'm told that Mr. Roy wasn't at that interview. I don't know why he, uh, he didn't show up, but maybe if he showed up, he would know that his allegations have been repeatedly disproven. But that's just one example of why Republicans uh, don't want transparency. That's why they don't want public hearings. They know that unless they do this behind closed doors, this whole extreme political stunt will evaporate because their lies will be exposed. And so they voted no on transparency and openness and no on open hearings. I think at the very least, Republicans should be more transparent and require a separate vote on a resolution authorizing our committee to go to court. And with that, I would urge a yes vote on my amendment, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from New York to recognize. I'm, I'm not really going to address that amendment, but my, my Democratic colleagues have tried to argue that the committees have experienced historic levels of cooperation from the White House and from the administration. And clearly, they've been taking their talking points directly from the White House. Uh, the committees have had to use all the tools in their toolbox to get compliance, and still the White House is refusing to provide documents and witnesses to in the furtherance of this investigation. Let's start with the suspicious activities reports. In the past, when Congress requested SARS, the Treasury Department provided them. But in a policy change, the Biden administration has refused. Only when the Oversight Committee noticed a hearing to discuss this obstruction did the Treasury Department provide them, but only in camera. Uh, let's look at the bank records. Chairman Comer has had to subpoena the banks for those records. Let's talk about FBI's FD-1023 form. This was a document that the FBI created based on information provided by a trusted confidential informant. The document details a bribery scheme involving Joe and Hunter Biden. When the Oversight Committee subpoenaed this document, the FBI initially wouldn't even acknowledge that the document existed. It took to the eve of a contempt markup of FBI Director Ray to gain access to this document. Again and again, the committees have had to fight to obtain records, information, and testimony to which they are entitled. In another example, the Oversight Committee has been requesting for months all the pseudonym emails when Joe Biden was Vice President. He even used his pseudonym to communicate with Hunter Biden's associates. There are at least 80,000 pages of emails that we know of. The Biden White House only produced 14 pages until the committee noticed this markup for the impeachment inquiry resolution. Even the White House has stated in writing that it does not plan to cooperate with this impeachment inquiry absent a vote. The House of Representatives needs this impeachment inquiry resolution to move forward in this investigation, to understand why President Biden continues to lie about his involvement with his family's business schemes. He has lied about knowing his son's business dealings, the source of his son's funds, about having contact with his son's business associates, benefiting from his son's businesses, his son doing anything wrong. 
Why does the president continue to lie? How deep was his role in his son's business scheme? And these schemes involve foreign oligarchs and CCP officials. They involve getting millions of dollars in exchange for no known good or service. They involved over 20 shell companies. We have evidence of direct payments to Joe Biden from his brother James and from Hunter. Hunter even paid Joe directly from the business account, an account that received millions from the CCP. If they were just loan repayments, where are the loan documents? The committees have asked for those loan documents. They've received nothing. And even if they were loan repayments, Joe Biden was still getting money from the CCP. Did he know it was from the CCP? These are why, we're, why we need to do this, this investigation and this inquiry. These are the questions that still need to be answered and why this impeachment inquiry resolution is absolutely needed. needed. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Gentleman's uh, right. Chairman, I, uh, boy, it, it, it's uh, just really amazing to hear some of the stuff that gets set up here. Um, the bottom line is everything the gentleman said um, has been disproven and debunked. Uh, and um, I mean, there's no there there. There's no there's no there's not even any smoke. Uh, and that's why earlier I, I read a list. I only I only read like the first 10 names of Republican members, uh, many of them who are on the committees of jurisdiction who have basically said there's no there there. But be that as it may, I mean, we are here uh, because Donald Trump wants us to be here. We are here because this is a convenient distraction for my Republican friends uh, for the fact that they have accomplished absolutely nothing, not a thing for the American people uh, since they took control of this house. Uh, we are here because they're trying to finish the job they couldn't get done on January 6th, and that is they want to overturn uh, the last election. That is why we are here. It is as clear as day. Uh, and so, um, you know, all these documents that the gentleman re refers to that, by the way, it seems that these committees are getting, um, again, you know, why, why can't we at least request, why can't we demand that the committees who get it file a report? Why can't we demand that they at least do one public hearing? Why can't we demand you know any transparency or any openness? So this is this is you know those are, those are bad talking points. Um, let me just say so. Uh, whoever puts them together, um, I think uh, you know uh, did my friend a disservice. But again, this is not a radical amendment. It's just it's just to me common sense. And again, I hope all my colleagues will vote yes. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there any further discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Chair, yes. Gentle lady from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you so very much. And I think that this once again proves the fact that we need what we just heard demonstrates that we need public hearings so that the public can listen to the witnesses. They can see how they are asked questions, what the answers are, so it's very clear. Because we have evidence from the record because they're of these like 90,000 page documents that have been produced that show that this loan that my colleague would refer to happened back in 2017 before President Biden had even announced his run for presidency. So it has nothing to do with what the president has done while serving in office these last three years, which is an incredible job, which is an incredible job, the most significant legislative achievement since the New Deal, in contrast to what we've done here, which is absolutely nothing. And the records show, the bank records show, that yes, there was a loan, and it was repaid, and that when it was repaid, there was precisely annotation saying this is for the repayment of a loan period in 2017 and 2018. This is the kind of information that's already significantly sort of in the record. We've gone over and over again with it. And I need to say that multiple independent fact checkers, including the Washington Examiner, which we know the Washington Examiner is not a left-leading organization, that they have fact checked that and proven otherwise than the allegations we are hearing. And so with that, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. 
Yeah, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle referring to, quote, extraordinary cooperation with the Justice Department, and then just raised questions about who was at a particular interview or not. I think that particular questioning was just Chairman Jordan, uh, given whatever was going on that day. I think it was, it was a circumstance in which he was the only one that was available uh, on the time. But, but in any event, we're, uh, you know, privy to what was discussed. And the, the fact is, is the Justice Department has been essentially unilaterally limiting the scope of what the department witnesses can testify about. That's been happening over and over and over again. Uh, when you look at the transcripts and when you look at the conversations, you know what's happening. When the witnesses come in and they're being told, hey, on this set of questions, answer, this is an ongoing investigation. That's what's actually happening. Um, and that's, uh, frankly, uh, a, a, a ongoing problem that we're having to deal with. And one of the reasons that's behind the need for an inquiry is to be able to go seek the truth where it actually may lead. And if, if there's no, if there's no there there, then I, I feel like my colleagues protest a little much. Um, given what we now know in terms of the amount of money that has been flowing into the Biden family, which is concerning on its face, the extent to which we now have an indictment of the president's son concerning on its face, the extent to which we have witness testimony that has come in before under oath talking about the extent to which the president himself was present and privy to the information involving Hunter. This is concerning on its face. The fact is, right now we have curtailment of investigative steps uh, to protect the Bidens, why prosecutors prohibited investigators from, from referencing, uh, you know, to dad and the big guy in witness interviews. Anytime any questioning goes down that line, the DOJ has been telling people, nope, stop, you say this is nothing but ongoing investigations. The fact that we had 84,000, whatever the number is, of all of the, the uh, email correspondence with the pseudonyms, and we've gotten 14 of them, on its face, this body deserves to get more information. I think this is very clear. The average American watching this would agree. I'm perfectly happy to stand behind that. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? The gentleman's recognized. Yeah, I, I just want to just say $2 billion from the Saudi government to Jared Kushner and not a word. Oh, that's just, that's just normal. Uh, I mean, come on. Give me a break. Uh, again, a little transparency, I think, uh, would be welcome here. Um, and quite frankly, I, you know, uh, I, this notion that we should trust the chairs of these respective committees to tell us all that they know when we know that they've been misrepresenting publicly what has been said privately, we'd like to see the transcripts. We'd like a little openness, that's all. The American people deserve that. You know, the way this resolution is written, you know, when it's all, all said and done with, no matter what happens, the American people may get nothing, may not get any report. Uh, at, at the end of the at the end of this process, so um, again, uh, you know, but two billion dollars from the Saudi government, come on, uh, and and no question, that's just perfectly normal. Uh, give me a break. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. As for recorded. Uh, Vote, Recorded votes been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Burgess votes no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushenthaler. Mr. Rushenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. Mr. Massey. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagus. Aye. Mr. Nagus, aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Uh, four yeas, seven nays. The noes have it. The amendment's not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I have a, another amendment, amendment number eight. The gentleman's uh, recognized. Oh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number eight to House Resolution 918, offered by Mr. McGovern. Page 14, line 18, strike. House Resolution 917 and insert House Resolution 917 as amended by the amendment specified in Section 7 of this resolution. At the end, add at the end the following. Section 7, Amendment to House Resolution 917. The amendment to House Resolution 917 referred to in Section 6 of this resolution is as follows. Page 4, line 12, insert before the semicolon the following. 
except with respect to a grand jury matter related to a criminal prosecution pending on the date of adoption of this resolution, a grand jury matter related to a prosecution arising from the attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021, or a grand jury matter in a case with respect to which pre former President Donald Trump is a defendant. The gentleman is recognized uh, to discuss his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, from the beginning of this Congress, uh, extreme mega Republicans have made it clear that they're willing to ab abuse the important constitutional power of impeachment for their own political goals. Chief among those goals, whatever Donald Trump tells them to do. The extreme mega architects of this impeachment have sought to intervene, disrupt, and undermine the numerous ongoing criminal uh, prosecutions of Donald Trump himself, along with his misguided followers who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. The extreme MAGA architects of this impeachment have made statements and written letters harassing the Georgia and New York prosecutors pursuing justice against Donald Trump in their states. The extreme MAGA architects of this impeachment have vowed to defund the special counsel Jack Smith's office just for doing his job of pursuing justice uh, without fear or favor. Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who recently claimed credit for goading uh, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy into launching this inquiry, and other extreme MAGA Republicans routinely refer to the criminals in prison for committing crimes on January 6th as hostages and patriots and promised retribution against the DOJ for their prosecutions. This resolution clears a path for these same extreme MAGA Trump protectors to seek and obtain law enforcement sensitive grand jury secret information at the heart of ongoing criminal prosecutions. Despite months of investigation, extreme MAGA Republicans cannot define any alleged high crimes or misdemeanors as the basis for this inquiry. It is not surprising then that this resolution contains no limit on the scope of the inquiry, and as a result, there is nothing here to constrain a motivated committee chair from demanding, ac assessing, uh, accessing, and spoiling critical information at the heart of ongoing criminal prosecutions of Donald Trump or January 6th defendants. I hope my Republican colleagues can agree that any legitimate inquiry concerning the conduct of the current president should have absolutely nothing to do with the pending cases against Donald Trump or the other individual criminals responsible for the insurrection against the Capitol on January 6th. If so, I expect that they will join me in voting for this amendment to protect the integrity of those ongoing prosecutions and prevent inappropriate interference. If they reject this amendment, it will be because they know this impeachment inquiry is more about protecting Donald Trump from justice and accountability than anything else. And I would urge uh, a unanimous vote on my amendment. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? <coughs> Hearing none, the questions on the amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Aye. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. I shall report a vote. Recorded vote's been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Reschenthaler, no. Mr. Reschenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach, Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy, no. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagus, aye. Mr. Nagus, aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, seven nays. And those have it. The amendment's not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. I have an amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number nine to House Resolution 918, offered by Mr. Neguse. Before the resolve clause, insert the following. Whereas by December 11th, in the first session, the 117th Congress had enacted 71 bills, the 116th Congress under divided government had enacted 78 bills, and the 118th Congress had enacted just 22 bills. And whereas, as of December 6, 2023, the House of Representatives has spent 26 days electing two speakers of the House, now therefore be it. 
film is recognized for honors amendment. I thank the chairman. This amendment is very simple, very straightforward, and it essentially recounts the inadequacies of this legislative session of Congress under Republican control for the better part of the last 12 months. The American people understand that the impeachment that Republicans have decided to pursue is a waste of time and is distorted from the priorities that they would like to see us as elected leaders address. They want to see us working on lowering costs, on growing the middle class, on building safer communities, on finding common ground. And it's unfortunate that as they look at the full spectrum of the last 11 months under Republican control, they will find nothing of the sort. The data speaks for itself. This will go down as the least productive Congress since 1933. Think about that. The least productive Congress since the Great Depression. That is what Republicans have brought the country in the form of their majority. And by the way, you go back almost 100 years, 90 years, plenty of those years, Republicans had a majority, Democrats had a majority, sometimes it was divided government, sometimes one party had a majority in every branch. But none of those years ultimately included a Congress as unproductive as this one. We have 48 hours left in terms of legislative work. Republicans obviously set the schedule. They set the calendar. They have informed the House and the country that the legislative week will end Thursday. Everyone will go home for holiday break. The year will end. No permanent farm bill reauthorization. No permanent FAA reauthorization. No action on critical national security considerations that the president has implored us as a Congress to take up. No action on funding government. When we return back in January, or in January, I should say, we'll face another set of dueling deadlines that Republicans have imposed to try to find a way to fund the government after two efforts in just the last four months by some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to shut the government down. It is hard for me, and I think awfully hard for the American people to identify a single thing of substance that the Republican majority has accomplished in these last 11 months beyond expelling one of their own members and, of course, ejecting their former speaker. And with all of that backdrop in mind, House Republicans have decided that the most important priority for the United States Congress to pursue before they go home for vacation is to start a baseless impeachment inquiry against the President of the United States. I think that's a sad state of affairs. I don't think it's reflective of the view of most Americans who, as I said, would just like to see all of us finding ways to find common ground and address the challenges of our time that are very pressing. It's deeply unfortunate. I think my colleagues know that. But they are committed to pursuing this course all the same. And so my hope is that we can at least <coughs> provide some factual context for the House to consider with respect to the whereas clauses that we're adding so that every member can be fully apprised as to the nature of this Congress. And with that, would, would the gentleman yield? Oh, sure, happy to yield. I had a mentor who uh, admonished me once to never confuse activity with progress. And I'm not sure that all of these bills constitute progress. I probably voted against most of them given my penchant for voting no. Um, how many of these were post office renamings? Yeah, uh, well, I'd say a couple of things, Mr. Massey. Uh, and I have no doubt, given your penchant for voting no, uh, that you would disapprove and disagree with the work 
of much of the prior Congresses, Republican and Democrat. I'm not accusing you, of course, um, uh, in a pejorative sense. What I would say is that even under your constrained view of the government, the statistics are sobering. I think it's tough to argue that this Congress has been a productive one. 22 bills, 22 bills enacted since the start of this year. 22. I mean, by the way, we could. We by, by the way, Representative Massey, I'll, I'll give you a chance, opportunity. There are plenty, I've had many conversations with some of your colleagues, Republican colleagues on the other side of the aisle, who have bills that are thoughtful, addressing some of the challenges that we face, that are bipartisan in nature. They can't get them to the floor. <laughs> they can't convince their leadership to allow them to come before this committee. So when I say that this is the least productive Congress in the history of, well, modern history of the country since the Great Depression, I'm not so sure that I would find much disagreement amongst some members of your own caucus, certainly not amongst the American people. Again, I understand the, the esoteric, esoteric argument you're making with respect to you know, some bills being less meaningful than others. That might be an argument to make when there is at least some numerical comparison to be made. In this case, the numbers speak for themselves. They're, they're, this Congress isn't doing anything. Anything. Put aside the numbers. I mean, I, I don't, I, I think you'd agree with me that it's probably a good idea that we have a permanent farm bill extension, right? I mean, I, you don't believe that we shouldn't, we should just forget about a permanent reauthor, a five year reauthorization for the farm bill and reauthorization for the FAA and funding the government and, and all these core. I mean, uh, of course, Gentleman Yeo. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to see the farm bill come to the floor. Uh, there's legislation in there that. I've introduced that would like to see that become law. Uh, Ms. Ledger Fernandez is a, is a co-sponsor of some of those uh, changes that we need. Uh, my only Let's point- Let's do that instead of yeah. impeachment. My only point was in, in a metric that includes the naming of post offices, uh, and we haven't named a lot of post offices this Congress. I gotta admit, we're kind of slacking on that regard. Uh, none since the new speaker hasn't even named a post office as far as I can tell. But I, I just think we shouldn't confuse activity with progress. And my constituents don't care about the number of bills we pass. They care about the quality of bills. Well, and I, I would and say, well, I, uh, and I, I have great respect, for my, th I great respect for my colleague. I understand the argument he's making. I would say I think your constituents in Kentucky, as well as my constituents in Colorado, do care about the farm bill being reauthorized. They care about the FAA bill. They care about the funding of government. And irrespective of where one lands on the numerical comparisons, and again, I think it's it is evident that the reality is this Congress, that many of the, the bills in prior Congresses that are included in that total were in fact substantive, not just post office naming bills. But I'll take the gentleman's point and would just suggest that in the last 11 months, again, I can't point to a single accomplishment uh, that the Republican majority has pursued. And Prioritization matters, right? I mean, ultimately, the Republican leadership, speaker, uh, committee chairs, they decide what the House is going to consider and what it's not going to consider. And the fact that all of those important priorities that I just mentioned, which I think the American people care deeply about, can't get to the floor. And meanwhile, the last vote, or the second to last vote we take before a holiday break will be the initiation of an impeachment inquiry. I think to me it just it encapsulates the entire approach that the Republican conference has taken this Congress. And I, that's all I'm just suggesting to you that I think most of the folks back in Kentucky, certainly the folks back in Colorado and Fort Collins and, and Grand County and elsewhere in my district, I go home, they're asking me about lower costs, they're asking me about inflation, they're asking me about how do we support our schools, how do we support public safety, how do we build safer communities. They're not asking me about impeachment inquiries. Would the gentleman yield just for one more sure. small fine point? This, in, this, this includes bills that were conferenced with the Senate or also passed the Senate and signed into law. Correct. Yes, correct. So um, there is, you know, we have passed legislation that's sitting in the Senate that hasn't passed. So 
while it's true that there's a Republican speaker and we're on our second one uh, to this Congress in the House, there's a Democrat leader in the Senate, and you have to find common ground between the well, two. And this is the fascinating part, Mr. Massey, because that would be a compelling argument, but, well, I think for it the still is. But, but for the fact that in the 116th Congress, Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House, Donald Trump was President of the United States, Mitch McConnell was the Senate Republican Majority Leader, and somehow we found a way to get 78 bills across the finish line in that Congress. I, I, you know, divided government notwithstanding, we found common ground, we charted a path forward. I, I suggest to you the problem in this instance, it's not a function of House Democrats or Senate Democrats or Senate Republicans or the White House. It is exclusively a function of the House Republican Caucus that has made clear, as you said, that they, they uh, do not value uh, you know, quantity with respect to legislation that we're pursuing um, and that they don't put a premium on actually getting bills signed into law that might make a difference in the American people's lives. And, and that, that's your preference, uh, stated preference. You're entitled to that preference, different than mine, but it has consequences. Well, in included in this statistic is the CARES Act, which has been, you know, that was the $2 trillion that Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, and, and Nancy Pelosi had. And almost your entire conference voted for, yes. Yes, and I was against it because I said it would I cause understand. inflation. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, I said it would cause inflation and shortages and a, and a lot of long-term maleffects to the economy, and here we are. So, again, I would just, and I'll leave it at this. I don't think we should conflate activity with progress. All right. And, I, and some people, because a lot of these bills, besides naming post offices, were spending bills, some of my constituents would rather they hadn't passed. Sure. Well, I will just simply say, and then I'm going to yield to the ranking member, that to the extent that the American people are interested in putting these accomplishments side by side, in the same span, same period of time that Republicans have had a majority, when Democrats had a majority, we passed the Chips and Science Act to onshore domestic manufacturing in Kentucky, in Colorado, in Ohio, across the heartland. We passed the Inflation Reduction Act, as you well know, uh, to decrease health care costs. We passed a bipartisan infrastructure law that is expanding broadband <coughs> de deployment across both of our respective states. I understand the gentleman voted against both of those bills, all of those bills, uh, but I, I would just suggest those measures reflected, they comported with what the American people would like to see us doing, which is solving problems. And this <coughs> is far from it. No, I, I'm glad the gentleman mentioned the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, well, most of my Republican colleagues voted against it. Uh, uh, just in case you forget what that bill is, that's the bill that uh, even though you voted against, you, you do press conferences and ribbon cuttings uh, every time some of that money goes to a, an infrastructure project in your respective district. But the sad part about uh, what is happening here, and the gentleman mentioned it, is that this Congress has become a place where trivial issues get debated passionately and important ones not at all. I mean, we spend weeks trying to figure out a Speaker of the House um, after the uh, previous Speaker of the House was ousted. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, and, uh, I mean, and, and the infighting on the Republican side uh, was so intense that it was unclear whether we would ever get a Speaker of the House. I mean, every time someone got mentioned, they would be shot down. Um, I do think the American people uh, want us to figure out ways to pass legislation that will help them. The gentleman mentioned the farm bill. Uh, it's not only, that's a bill that not only impacts our farmers um, and is important for our economy, uh, but it also deals with issues of nutrition and food insecurity, which unfortunately remains a big problem in this country. Uh, they want us to come together and figure this out. You know, you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. But in this Congress, um, even when you agree on something, uh, a small group on the far right gets to veto it. And so there are a lot of things that we could do in a bipartisan way that unfortunately never see the light of day. Um, and we spend our time doing this kind of stuff. You know, oh, let's launch an impeachment inquiry against Joe Biden. We don't really have any evidence. There's no smoke, there's nothing. But you know what, hey, you know, it's, it's red meat for our base. and. Fundraising emails can go out, and Donald Trump wants it. We'll just do whatever he wants, and he'll be happy. And I'm just saying that I think people are 
surprised and disappointed that, um, that this is a Congress that is not producing much. And again, I get that the gentleman votes usually against almost everything, and that's fine. But, um, but for the vast majority of people in this country, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, they, they want to see us function. I mean, and you know, and we're, we should be talking right now about how to avoid a government shutdown in January or February. To the best of my knowledge, we're not even having any preliminary conversation. Uh, but we're, we have time for this. We don't have time to make sure we keep the lights on, but we have time for this. It is just so frustrating. And to the gentleman's point, that we are going to spend time, not only in this committee, but tomorrow on the floor <laughs> debating this and, and not debating a supplemental package or uh, not figuring out how to keep the government running or not doing anything of, of like that matters to anybody, but we're doing this because it matters to one person, Donald Trump, I mean, I think is really a sad commentary on where we are, I regret to say. I yield back to the gentleman. Yield to the gentlewoman from Connecticut. Thank you very much. And I think that what 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 this discussion that we're having here talks about is the difference between governing and political execution. And what we have pointed out through the bills that we passed, through the accomplishment of investing in your infrastructure, investing in rural America like we have not invested in since the New Deal, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the Chips and Science Act, the American Rescue Plan, or investments in rural America like we have not seen since the New Deal. And that is about governance. And that is what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to be about not just passing the farm bill, which has expired and needed a safe, you know, we're going to have to push it to next year, but we won't let it expire, but we should have worked on it. We should have gotten our legislation in there and passed. It's also we couldn't pass the agriculture appropriations bill. We couldn't pass the things that we're supposed to do about governing. And Democrats know how to govern. And that's what we showed last Congress. We governed on behalf of the people we represent. And what we have done this year is indeed political execution. And so, you know, my colleague from Pennsylvania, Representative Wachenschauer says that impeachment is a political execution. That somehow Democrats are to blame for this impeachment because we impeached President Trump. Once again, doesn't the committee remember what happened on January 6th? I suggest again that anybody who wants to vote for this impeachment inquiry ask the law enforcement officers who were battered and beaten protecting the House floor. Ask them what that impeachment was about. It wasn't a political exercise. What happened on January 6th was a violent attack on our democracy, and impeachment should not be normalized. It should not be a political exercise. It should be reserved for something like that where the evidence was overwhelming. And even if it is a political exercise, my suggest to my colleagues that the politics are not on your side. The public does not support this inquiry. According to a morning consult survey from earlier this month, the number of Americans who believe Congress should start these impeachment proceedings has decreased to around 40%. That's compared to Trump's January 6th impeachment trial, which had a majority of Americans supporting him. We know, we've had polls and we've looked at it, that impeachment is not a top priority of your constituents. The Congressional Integrity Project commissioned polling and asked what are the polling. And they found that 74% of Americans, including 68% of independents, in those districts that your members represent, that Biden won, in those districts, the people, your constituents, believe that we should focus on issues like the economy, inflation, crime, over what we're doing here. 90% of voters, including 93% of independents, want Congress to stop playing partisan games and work to address these issues. You know, I mean, three in five Americans supported the impeachment of Donald Trump for what happened. And that was after a month of evidence, because we didn't need to collect a lot of evidence. 
because we have lived through it. You all, your committees have been collecting evidence for 11 months and leaking it out to the, to the public as we described earlier. And you still cannot get the public supporting the inquiry that you are about to undertake. And I would suggest that if you are concerned that this is a political exercise, that you look and ask yourselves, what do the American people want? And they don't want this. And this is so different than the impeachment that we felt compelled to do and that Republicans supported us. Remember, you're going to proceed on this on a purely partisan effort. Republicans in the House and in the Senate voted to impeach and to convict for January 6th. And with that, I'm going to yield back to my colleagues. And uh, I thank the gentlewoman. And I yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. I've been here since late in 2018, just over five years. And it has been my misfortune to be here for two impeachments of the President of the United States. But what is markedly different about those two impeachments is the amount of study we engaged in, constitutional study, rereading the Federalist Papers, debating about whether the trauma of an impeachment to the country was required by the evidence we had in front of us. The discussion was about how the evidence we had in front of us, whether the evidence of trying to extort an ally, an ally who, as we speak, is begging for us to provide aid, um, whether that evidence or the evidence of what happened on January 6th, both of them demanded action because we had a rogue president who was undermining our constitutional order. That's not the conversation we're having here today. The conversation we're having here today is, well, we've been through tens of thousands of pages of things. We've interviewed people. We've deposed people. We haven't found anything, so we need to crank it up a notch so we can continue to keep fishing around and looking for something. That's not an impeachment basis. Um, and it's really, really disturbing to see the depths to which this House has sunk with this inquiry. Um, you know, we said at the outset, this is a waste of time. It's a political stunt. It's a mega kangaroo court. And I'm just really disappointed um, that so many of our colleagues are willing to sleepwalk through this entity and don't have the guts to stand up to it. I yield back. I would simply say, uh, Mr. Chairman, I share the sentiments of Ms. Scanlon and Ms. Ledger Fernandez. I've served in Congress since 2018. I've served on the Judiciary Committee uh, throughout the duration of my tenure in the Congress. I believe I'm the only member of this committee who has served as a House prosecutor during the second impeachment trial of President Trump and spent many a day preparing for that trial and making the case to our colleagues in the upper chamber. I know a thing or two about impeachment and about the constitutional standards the exacting nature of that standard. I was with many of you in the House chamber on the second floor on January 6th. I remember it well. I remember the outrage that so many of us felt on both sides of the aisle at what President Trump had done in inciting a mob to come and disrupt and interfere with the peaceful transfer of power. He was impeached for that on a bipartisan basis with good cause. And he has been singularly focused ever since on exacting retribution. He's made that clear. He posts about it often on social media. It's been reported that he's communicated directly to our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, what he's communicated to the public, which is that he demands that House Republicans exact this political revenge and impeach President Biden. And that's why 
our colleagues are pursuing this spec. Notwithstanding the damage it'll do to the country, and notwithstanding the way in which it will divert this Congress from being able to prioritize the issues that ultimately matter to the American people. And perhaps that's the best place to close. There's a quote I'll read. I thought it summarized this well. Quote, while they fixate on overturning a presidential election, Americans continue to face high prices at the drugstore, roads and bridges that are falling apart, and a broken immigration system. Sorry, while House Democrats fixate on overturning a presidential election, Americans continue to face high prices at the drugstore, roads and bridges that are falling apart, and a broken immigration system. We need to end this political theater and get back to work for the American people, end quote. That's a quote from my friend, Mr. Reschenthaler, when he voted against the impeachment inquiry resolution in November, end of October of 2019, four years ago. It's hard to believe it came that long. I would ask him to heed his own words and perhaps maybe our colleagues to do the same. Let's get back to work on behalf of the American people. Let's work on addressing immigration, public safety, lowering costs. That's my request. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my friend from Colorado made a perfect dovetail into my comments because <clears throat> I, I believe I was, I've was i been misquoted twice now. Earlier in the uh, hearing, I said explicitly that the standard of impeachment has been lowered by the Democrats to the point now where it's, in essence, a political exercise. This isn't a political exercise. We were simply going to have an inquiry, a vote on an inquiry to start the process in order to, and, and again, I've said it ad nauseum, the Biden administration is refusing to comply. They, their own lawyers have said we need to have a vote on, on the inquiry, and that's what we're doing. But, um, but again, during the first impeachment of Trump, I was on the committee with, uh, with my friend from Colorado and judiciary, and I said, if we move forward with this impeachment, we are, in essence, making this a political exercise. And I said then, if you have a president and a House of Representative of two different political parties, it's now going to be just expected by whatever base you have, whether it's Democrat or Republican, that you're going to have an impeachment. And then I reiterated those same comments on impeachment number two when I sat in the same exact chair that my friend is sitting in from Colorado right now. From there, I, I said the same exact words. So um, yeah, I spoke out against impeachment twice because I felt the standard had not been met. And I would still reiterate this, that there wasn't enough evidence to go forward. There weren't the high crimes and misdemeanors. Instead, the Democrats continue to push it forward. And now we have a situation where impeachment, the standard of impeachment has been lowered to such a degree that, again, it, it's merely, at this point, a political exercise. Not that this is a political exercise, but the, the bar has been lowered. And if you don't believe me, let, let's just go back and look uh, historically. In 2017, December 6, 2017, you had H. Res. 646. 58 Democrats voted to advance an article of impeachment for the high crime or misdemeanor of, and wait for this one, disrespecting the NFL League anthem protest and calling a member of Congress wacky. That was the high crime and misdemeanor back in December of 2017. Then January uh, of 2018, January 19, 2018, HRES 705, 66 Democrats voted to advance impeachment for the high crime or misdemeanor of President Trump's, wait for it, rhetoric. You try to impeach him just for rhetoric. Uh, I mean, that is absolutely laughable. It didn't stop there. July 17, 2019, HRES 498. 95 Democrats voted to advance impeachment for the high crime or misdemeanor of, this is another really good one, insulting the squad. I, I mean, it's, it's absolutely laughable. So when I say that the Democrats have reduced the standard of impeachment to a point where it's just absolutely absurd, you have. And now we're just playing by the same rules that, that you set for us in the last two, um, or I'm sorry, in the, um, in the 116th Congress. But with that, I would yield back. Mr. Chairman. Where? Oh, I'm sorry. The gentlelady from Indiana is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to note for the record that according to this amendment, um, the 
House spent 26 days electing two speakers. I don't dispute we spent that much time, but we were thrown into that situation not by Republicans, but by eight Republicans and 208 Democrats that voted to vacate the chair. So the fact that we had to spend extra time dealing with our own speaker election, we wouldn't have had to do that if were it not for 208 Democrats voting with eight Republicans to make that happen. Um, I'd also like to note there's been lots of talk about what we've not done. Just yesterday, we passed the Lower Cost, More Transparency Act, reducing health care costs for American families. That was a bipartisan effort that passed the House last night on suspension uh, by wide margins. So despite us needing to do this work procedurally, uh, we are still accomplishing things on behalf of the American people. I yield back. Don't lay the yields back. Is there any further discussion? There's a young lady from here. Right here. Oh, you're, you're, you're from me. Yeah. We're just, we, the we just lady from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, I just want to know that, uh, Mr. Marcantello, I think there is a difference between what passes the House and what leadership supports. And so the, you know, the instances uh, you've described, that's not what passed the House. That is not what leadership supported, because if they had, then it would have been supported. What we're talking about, what we're talking about is the January 6th impeachment. That is the standard <coughs> for which we think you should say that is the standard. When you say we've lowered the standard, well, the standard should be something as grievous as that, something as grievous as trying to bribe a foreign government. Those are big things. Little things like that, you know, where you get 50 some uh, people upset about something or another, 60 some about something else. That is not what leadership is pursuing. Your leadership, as evidenced by the hearing today, as evidenced by the resolution, as evidenced by the vote that will be taken on a purely partisan basis tomorrow, <laughs> is supporting impeachment inquiry where there is nothing there. And I think it's also very insulting. Well, I was struck by something I, saw, I read um, by the chair, um, uh, Chair Como, who, as I said, uh, he's appeared before us. I respect him. But with regards to the binding, there's sort of become like the vengeance is almost like blinding uh, people to the needs of government, blinding them to you know, what they're saying, um, where, you know, when he was talking about impeachment, he actually described that in talking to the people who listen to CNN, who watch CNN, and need to hear about impeachment, that they were, quote, a low IQ audience. We should not lower expectations. We should not expect that Americans understand the importance of what we're doing here today, the importance of what we're doing and what it means and what the framers were talking about, which is what, you know, our only impeachment manager on this committee talked about, how serious this action is and how serious we should be. And with that, I yield our, our ranking member. You know, I, I just want to, for the record, uh, the general lady from Indiana, I, I just want to make clear, please don't blame Republican dysfunction on Democrats. You know, it's not our fault it took 15 votes to elect your first speaker. It's not our fault that uh, it took two weeks after uh, your first speaker was ousted to find another speaker. I mean, the idea that we should vote for uh, a, a Republican speaker of the House who, who doesn't share our values, you know, we voted for Hakeem Jeffries. Uh, we voted our values, but that it's our fault. You changed the rules to make it possible uh, for it, for, for any member on your side to oust a sitting speaker. You did that. Uh, so you've changed the rules to make this dysfunction easier. Um, and so don't, please don't blame that on us. Um, thank you. I yield back. Uh, yield to uh, Judge Marcantello. I thank the gentlewoman. And I would just simply say, I think the gentlewoman made a salient point, which is the argument that Mr. Eschenbauer was making, that 
the vast majority of us can access and therefore it's being referenced. But there's essentially motions to table um, impeachment resolutions that have been introduced by various different Democrats where Democrats had the minority and essentially citing that, that there were various groups who voted in favor of, of, or rather, who voted to oppose the motion to table, that that is somehow equivalent to the impeachment inquiry vote that the Republican majority will insist on tomorrow, I just don't think is a, a good faith argument. And I, and, I, and I think where I struggle, among many of the other objections that we've made today around due process and, and uh, the misplaced priorities that House Republicans are pursuing, but you know, to the extent you want to talk about constitutional standards and high crimes and misdemeanors, it's, it's unclear to me, I think it's unclear to the vast majority of the American people what high crime and misdemeanor you're investigating. I don't know if you have an answer in that regard. I, I don't... All right, well, first, thank you for yielding. I appreciate it. First off, I said nothing about... Um, the motion to vacate, that, that was a number, that was another one of my colleagues. I've been simply focused on impeachment. No, I'm talking about the motion to table. I wasn't referencing the motion to vacate. I'm talking okay, about I'm the sorry. votes that okay. you referenced in 2017 and right. 2018, right. which neither of you and I were here for, as you know, uh, on resolutions that have been introduced by different members of Congress, impeachment resolutions that Democrats introduced when they were in the minority and those resolutions were tabled. The, I believe the votes that you're referencing were the motion to table vote totals. And so, yes, I understand your argument, but I'm saying that's clearly not equivalent to the impeachment inquiry that you all intend to initiate tomorrow against uh, President Biden. But anyway, to the core, I think the question I'm asking Where, you is, you, okay, go ahead, what, what, what is the specific constitutional crime that you're investigating? Well, we're having an inquiry, so we can do an investigation. It can okay. control the production of witnesses. And, and what is the and, crime and, you're investigating? And documents. High crimes, misdemeanors, and bribery. What high crime and misdemeanor are you investigating? Look, I, I will, once I get time, I will explain what we're looking at, and I will make the equivalency no, I'm just of asking you the for last the, impeachment. I, okay, so I, what I'm trying to say, Mr. Reschenthaler, and again, I say this because I served as a prosecutor <coughs> during the last impeachment of former President Trump. There was a specific high crime that he was impeached for on a bipartisan basis. 13 Republicans agreed. During 2019, when President Trump was impeached, there were two very specific offenses that he was impeached for. And I can't get an answer. I don't think members of the Oversight Committee could get an answer, uh, or the Ways and Means Committee, or the Judiciary Committee. I don't think there is an answer. I, th there's not, and of course, it's, it's unsurprising because according to even Fox News correspondents, House Republicans have been unable to make any kind of connection to a, a constitutional high crime and misdemeanor and President Biden. So I don't, I would say this, to make the argument that there is some similarity between, and I don't know if this is what you're suggesting, I hope it's not, between the various facts that, that you've focused and zeroed in on with respect to President Biden and President Trump's conduct on January 6th. I just, very clear to me, the American people would reject that yeah, argument no. outright. Um, and by the way, I will say, because I mean, Ms. Ledger Fernandez can make this argument. One of the reasons that I respect Mr. Roy, and him and I have deep disagreements, and I understand that he op opposed both of the prior impeachments against President Trump. But I want to, it's an important clarification because before I quote you, I, you know, I know, want to make sure that it's accurate. All that being said, you, attested on the House floor in the days after January 6th that President Trump had engaged in impeachable conduct. That's the, the phrase you used, that he, quote, deserved, he deserves universal condemnation for what was clearly, in my opinion, impeachable conduct. I understand you opposed, obviously, the, the resolution that was ultimately approved for different reasons. You're not going to hear any member on our side of the describing President Biden's actions in that way because there is no impeachable conduct that Republicans have identified. And so very distinct differences, a very deep contrast between the impeachment against President Trump, former President Trump, for inciting that insurrection on January 6th, 
and the impeachment process that you all have cited in your city is simply not in play. Uh, and I can yield back to the gentleman. Thank you. I yield back. The only lady yields back. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. One thing, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it in the interest of time. I, I do want to note there is significant indication that has been referenced by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that there's no backing by the American people. Um, AP poll, 65, 68% of United States adults uh, believe that President Biden is engaged in illegal or unethical but not illegal conduct. 35% say illegal, 33% say unethical but not illegal. That's all while we're going through the hearings and looking at the conduct that we see before us. So there is a significant amount, and not just Republican, significant amount of independents, some Democrats, who believe that the president, uh, as vice president, as president, as private citizen, has engaged in conduct that is deserving of looking into it. To answer the gentleman's question, the question before us, I think, is whether President Biden used his office for his personal gain or his family's gain, whether there was influence peddling involved, whether there was international dollars flowing to the president as vice president or as private sector, uh, private citizen after leaving the office of the vice presidency. And we have an obligation to follow those dollars. That's point one. Point two is whether or not the vice president then lied about said behavior, uh, repeatedly saying, uh, saying, I never talked business with anybody with respect to his son's business dealings. We have ample evidence on the record indicating that there was, in fact, presence by the president when he was the vice president at business dealings of Hunter and knew full well that that kind of behavior was ongoing. Thirdly, and importantly, is whether or not there has been rampant obstruction by virtue of what we've seen out of the Department of Justice with the orders going down to say that you're going to say that this is, you know, under investigation, that you're not going to answer those questions. What exactly happened, by the way, with Weiss cutting this sweetheart deal? Suddenly the judge says no. Uh, that's a bad deal. Suddenly then there's going to be actual real indictments that followed from that in September and then notably last week. Following those dollars, looking to see what exactly happened. I can, I've got double pages here of all of the ways in which the Department of Justice has uh, breached standard protocol, allowing the statute of limitations very quite likely purposely, very quite likely purposely allowing the statute of limitations to lapse on tax problems from 2014 and 2015, very specifically because that was most likely to be tied to the time at which Vice President Biden was involved. These, there are numerous things I could go down the list of, but there are lots of things the American people want to know the truth about. We're going to continue to pursue the truth, and that's what this is about. I yield back. With the gentleman. Is there further discussion or debate in the amendment? A uh, gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. I'll be, I'll be brief, and I'm going to yield some of my time to the guy, but, you know, <clears throat> Look, if America's watching this, uh, if you interviewed uh, in Colorado and Pennsylvania, anywhere across the country, your top ten concerns for the main hardworking taxpayer on the street, would they say uh, Congress hadn't passed so many, hadn't passed a good number of bills? Would they say the Speaker of the House was really worried about that? Would they say January 6th is a top concern? I would argue, I'd wager a good bit of money, they would not. What would they say? And Ms. Uh, Leger Fernandez, you mentioned good government. Good governance. Would they say having a wide open border and letting eight to 12 million illegals that are coming through New York City uh, and all over the country, is that good governance? Would they say uh, having a young Americans die uh, because of an open fentanyl trade, would they say that's good governance? Would they say leaving Americans in Afghanistan? To die, is that good governance? Would they say um, spending more money than they make is good governance? Would they say that buying oil from foreign countries instead of producing them here in America uh, and the price that they're paying versus four years ago, uh, is that good governance? Now, I would say those are the top concerns. And Ms. Scanlon, you mentioned, you know, where's the guts to, to um, I guess, stop what you perceive as Republicans, where's the guts on your side? You got a president, Joe Biden, who's cognitively gone. Why don't you get with his, his analysts, whoever it is? Now, you can argue if you think he's not cognitively gone, I would wager a good bit of money. You give, you give him with five doctors, they would tell you the man's not there. 
Now, um, that's what America is concerned about. That's what America wants. Would the and gentleman you, yield? Let me just finish. Those are the concerns, and it, I, I get the fear to, to try to divert this to the things you mentioned about the hearing, how you think. The real concerns are affecting the pocketbooks of Americans, mm -hmm. and you're going to see it. Uh, I hear it. I'm in that world, uh, or construction world. And they're sick and tired of what this administration is doing to sell this country out. And they're going to let us, they will let their feelings known. Now, you can disagree with that, but, um, and I will yield just a few minutes. I want to get to Guy, but I yield back, I, yield to you. I, um, I do disagree vehemently with what you've said. Have you spent any time with Mr. Biden, with the president? Good God, Did you go, no. Good God, no. No, you've been watching a little too much Fox News. Not Fox. Watch, watch him on Fox if he'll go there. Watch him on the few, uh, how many press conferences does he have? What can he not, what can he get off teleprompter and read? You tell me. I have spent hours with the president without teleprompter, and the level of his conversation is way above this committee right now. Mr. Chandler, he doesn't know where back. he is. He doesn't know where he is. He walks, unless he's uh, directionally challenged. But um, anyway, um, I, I get to theater and I get the wordsmithing and all that. But quite frankly, it's, it's an embarrassment what this country is going through under caused by this administration under one man or his handlers, whoever it is. Uh, I yield to Mr. Roberts. Uh, I want to thank my friend from South Carolina. Look, there's been a lot of talk equating these impeachments. Um, I'm very familiar with the last two impeachments. I was in judici I was on judiciary uh, during the first one. And remember, the second one didn't go through committee. It went through the Rules Committee. I sat in Mr. Neguse's chair during that. So very familiar with the facts of both the impeachments. The first impeachment, just taking one at a time, was over a quid pro quo. I still think the quid pro quo didn't take place, but I do know who did have a quid pro quo, and that's Joe Biden. And you don't have to take my word for it. We have him on tape, dead to rights, bragging about shutting off aid to Ukraine in order to get a prosecutor, who's actually probably the one guy in that government that wasn't corrupt, that guy going after Burisma, which his son sat on the board of Burisma. Quite, quite amazing. So in a sense, President Trump, the first impeachment, got impeached for something that Joe Biden actually did and then, what, and then went on TV and bragged about it. So, so it's, a, it's quite amazing he would open the door to that. But there is a, and again, we're just here to decide if there should be an inquiry to proceed with investigations. And again, to compel uh, the, the, the production of documents and the testimony of witnesses. But I'm, I'm looking at the facts here. I mean, I've got sheets and sheets of evidence here. Uh, the House Oversight Committee has uncovered that Owasco, which is Hunter Biden's um, shell company, that it received payments from Communist China on at least three occasions, made direct payments, to, and then made direct payments to Joe Biden in 2018. Uh, the Oversight Committee has also found that Joe Biden received uh, about a quarter of a million dollars in direct payments from his family members who were making this money through their corrupt influence, influencing peddling schemes. Like, we know he got that money, and I'm, I'm sorry, that wasn't money to repay a car. That was a quarter of a million dollars that, that went to Joe Biden. You also have $40,000 in laundered money from Communist China. The Oversight Committee also found tens of millions of dollars from foreign adversaries funneled to the Biden family through corrupt influence peddling schemes. Uh, you have Devin Archer testifying that on approximately 20 occasions, Joe Biden called in or was part um, of, of the speakerphone conversations during Hunter Biden's business meetings. I, I mean, this is just what's been uncovered so far. And this is without, again, the impeachment inquiry going forward. So I, I am convinced that if we move forward with the impeachment inquiry, we'll be able to show that the Biden family and their business associates received roughly $24 million, if not more, from foreign sources over the course of roughly five years. We'll probably be able to show that President Biden was personally involved in his family's foreign uh, business dealings and business arrangements um, with others, and that Biden has not been truthful about his family's foreign business entanglements. But that, that is just a minimum uh, to move forward with the impeachment inquiry. So again, you can compare it to the, the, the first Trump impeachment all, all you want, because in a lot of ways, like I've said, you impeach Trump for what Biden actually did. But with that, I yield back to my friend from South Carolina. Is there any further uh, discussion or debate on the amendment? A gentle, gentle lady speak recognition? Yes. Gentle ladies recognize. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, and I think that uh, what, what was interesting about this interchange were a couple of key things. One is that much of this conversation that we heard from Mr. Mr. Roy and Mr. Washenthaler dealt with uh, accusations, accusations uh, that I entered into the record earlier about how these reports and these statements have actually shown to be contrary to the testimony and contrary to the records and documents. Like even uh, the reporting from conservative news outlets have said these statements that we just heard from Mr. Washenthaler and from Mr. Roy and others have actually been debunked, uh, inconsistent with the records, uh, you know, directly contrary to what is, uh, is in evidence. But they also point to the fact that some of these things happened in 2017 and 2018. That was before President Biden was in office. They own, the Republicans own witnesses have testified that in order to pursue an impeachment against a sitting president, you have to identify wrongdoing by the president during his presidency. I quote, the relevant office for impeachment should remain the presidency, not the vice presidency of Joe Biden. That's Jonathan Turley. That is your expert saying that out, setting that out. So all of the stuff that you've talked about is not relevant to the impeachment of President Biden sitting as President Biden. And I think that that's what it is. We're hearing all these conspiracy theories that have been debunked that you know the record shows is not true. And in fact, want to talk about what really happened no, to Ukraine ranking member? Yeah, no, I, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to constantly have to correct the record when the record is clear. The gentleman from Pennsylvania uh, was wrong about the prosecutor in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, he, you know, Vice President Biden's uh, call for the resignation of Ukraine's corrupt Prosecutor General uh, Viktor Shokin. Uh, the gentleman implies was somehow a secret uh, effort to help Burisma, uh, the Ukrainian energy company on whose board Hunter Biden served. Uh, the reality is that uh, this was a falsehood put forward by, oh, another, uh, one of their star uh, validators, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, in fact, Vice President Biden led a bipartisan international coalition calling on Ukraine to address corruption and reform the prosecutor general's office led by Shokin. So far from helping Burisma or its owner, uh, firing uh, Shokin increased the likelihood that Burisma would, would actually be investigated. But, you know, my friends know this. I mean, th th this is not new information. Uh, they know what the truth is, but it, it doesn't matter. And so we know where all this is going, right? This is not an inquiry. I mean, my friends have decided they're going to do this no matter what. They're just going to have to try to cobble something together uh, to actually bring an impeachment resolution to the floor. So this is, that's what this is. This is not about the truth. This is not about facts. It's not about investigations. It's about pushing um, lies and distortions that have been corrected over and over and over again. And it again underlies our concern as to why my friends will not ag agree to uh, a, a, an amendment saying that at least there has to be a one public hearing um, or agree to a more open and transparent process. It is clear what's going on, but come on. I mean, you know, we're resuscitating and regurgitating debunked stories and conspiracy theories. I mean, I, I, I think we're, I think my colleagues are better than that. I yield back. Thank you, and I think that, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may uh, uh, enter into the record an Axios article titled, Former Giuliani Associate Urges Comer to Abandon Biden Investigation. Without objection. Because this article describes how, you know, the whole Burisma uh, uh, conspiracy theory started with Giuliani and his associates. And even the people who were involved in that are saying, abandon it. There was nothing there. And they wrote a letter started with Giuliani and his associates. And even the people who were involved in that are saying, abandon it. There was nothing there. And they wrote a letter to Comer explaining how there was nothing there. And uh, I, I, would, I would quote from this saying, uh, wrote a scorching letter claiming 
thinking there is simply no merit for the investigation. With all due respect, Chairman Comer, the narrative you are seeking for the investigation has been proven false many times over by a wide array of respected source, uh, sources. And this is something that's in the record, <coughs> but when Chairman Comer is asked about it, he says, well, I don't know anything about that, but it's in the record as he sent to them. And so to constantly raise this issue of Ukraine, when those who first sort of said, well, we have, we have some dirt on the vice president are now recanting and saying, actually, there was nothing there, that's why we want a public hearing so that this kind of information can be seen, can be televised. We want it to be televised so the American public can judge for themselves and with that, I yield back to Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Certainly. Is there any further discussion or debate on the Mr. amendment? Mr. Chairman, I just want to insert uh, an article into the record um, by Jonathan Turley, since his name was just invoked, uh, outlining his uh, very strong belief that there is significant evidence uh, for this committee and this, this uh, body, I should say, to pursue with respect to an, an impeachment inquiry where he walks through the many reasons why that would be important Without objection. Uh, with respect to the president the vice, and in his role as vice president and to answer the question that there is subsequent uh, obstruction activities as president that would, that would answer the question the gentleman uh, put forward. I yield back. Thank you very much. Is there further discussion or debate on the amendment? Hearing none, the questions on the amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say no. No. Opinions share the no's have it. Roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Burgess votes no. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rashenthaler. Mr. Rashenthaler, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey, no. Mr. Norman. No. Mr. Norman, no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy, no. Mrs. Houchin. No. Mrs. Houchin, no. Mr. Langworthy. No. Mr. Langworthy, no. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon, aye. Mr. Nagoose. Aye. Mr. Nagoose, aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez. Aye. Ms. Leisure Fernandez, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeays, nine nays. Nine noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Hearing no request for further amendments, I understand that uh, my friend, our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Govern, has uh, some closing remarks. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me just say uh, that I always appreciate the tone uh, and the civility and respect in which you conduct this committee's proceedings. Uh, you're a good man. I just wish you voted with me more. Um, <laughs> but uh, but on, on this occasion, uh, I have to note that I'm deeply disappointed that we were going to advance this shameful impeachment inquiry, which is only going to further divide this country. The things that my Republican colleagues say about President Biden are unhinged, untethered to reality, let alone substantiated by the evidence. Maybe these are the alternative uh, facts that they always talk about. But it's been, it's been said already, but it bears repeating, this, Repu this Republican majority is abusing and weaponizing the impeachment process to go after President Biden with not a shred of evidence that he did anything wrong. In fact, they're going, they're doing so despite a mountain of evidence that President Biden has always followed the law. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to speak directly to the people of America. You need to know, you need to know that Republicans here in Washington still refuse to accept that Joe Biden won. They refuse to accept that in a free and fair election, President Biden got 7 million more votes and won the Electoral College. Now, they might, be, they might be cute about it. They say things like, Joe Biden is president, but they will not admit he won fair and square. Or maybe they don't care because they have contempt for you, the voters. They tried to stop the certifi certification of the results to prevent Joe Biden from becoming president. Many of them still cheer on the insurrectionists. Many Republicans supported what the violent mob was trying to do. They wanted Trump to stay in power the people's votes be damned. You know, I was one of the last people off the House floor uh, on January 6, 2021. I took over for Speaker Pelosi after she was evacuated. I saw them pounding at the door uh, in the Speaker's lobby, trying to get at us, trying to kill us. Trump sent them here to this building to reverse the election results 
and certify that he won, even though he lost. And now the MAGA extremists who have, have control of this place want to finish the job. They still want to overturn the election. And what they couldn't accomplish on January 6th, they want to do with this extreme political stunt. They will do whatever it takes to win, and if we lose our democracy in the process, so be it. When it comes right down to it, this absurd impeachment inquiry has nothing to do with the integrity of President Biden, not a thing. And it has everything to do with the lack of integrity uh, in the Republican Party, which has been taken over by MAGA extremists. And no amount of evidence could, could convince them that Joe Biden did nothing wrong because they aren't looking for the truth. They're looking for revenge. Their partisan impeachment stunt has no credibility, no legitimacy, and no integrity. And no vote could possibly make this baseless fishing expedition legitimate. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I understand my friend from Pennsylvania also has some closing remarks he would like to make. Gentlemen's I do. Tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, just going through a whole bunch of remarks from President Joe Biden calling President Trump an illegitimate president. But uh, I'll, I'll set those aside for now. I, I'd like to enter uh, into the record. Uh, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter a written statement from Professor Turley uh, from the United States House of Representative Committee on uh, Oversight and Accountability from the 28th of September, 2023. Without objection. Thanks. I just think that this is so fitting just to, just to read a brief portion of this because it explains exactly what we're here uh, to do today. And Professor Turley said, and I quote, my testimony also reflects the fact that I do believe that after months of investigation, the House has passed the threshold for an inquiry into whether President Joe Biden was directly involved or benefited from the corrupt practices of his son, Hunter, and others. I believe the record has developed to the point that the House needs to answer troubling questions surrounding the president. He goes on to say, the record currently contains witness and written evidence that the president, one, has lied about key facts in these foreign dealings, Two, was the focus of a multi-million dollar influence peddling scheme. And three, may have benefited from his corruption through millions of dollars sent to his family, as well as more direct possible benefits. The president may be able to disprove or rebut these points, but they raise legitimate concerns over his role based on the accounts of key figures in the matter. So I would just like to um, point to the statement of Professor Turley, and thank you for putting in the record. I yield back. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, before we proceed with the, the uh, resolution, let me make a few closing remarks. First, I want to thank everybody on the panel on both sides of the aisle. Clearly, this is a difficult subject to talk about. Clearly, there are sharp differences of opinion, but uh, uh, I was very pleased with the demeanor that everybody uh, went about making their points is. I do want to refocus this. We've heard a great deal about President Trump. We've had heard a great deal about President Biden. The purpose of the hearing is really simply about setting up a process. No one here should have a predetermined outcome uh, in mind as to where they think we're going. You might have a, a predilection, but uh, none of us know all the facts. And the reality is that uh, is what we're seeking to do, is to empower uh, committees uh, to have the ability to fully investigate charges and come to independent conclusions and make a recommendation at that point, uh, whatever it is, if they decide to recommend anything at all, then the House will deal with it. So we uh, covered a lot of ground, but some of it wasn't directly related to the process, and I think it's important to know that. Uh, the commitment I'll make to each of you on this committee is we'll continue uh, to do our job in a fair and professional manner certainly continue to have your ability to, to uh, make your points and your point of view known. Uh, I don't ever expect unanimity on the Rules Committee. It's not set up to achieve that. Um, but again, I do want to conclude by rem reminding people there's a process that's underway. Uh, there's legitimate concerns and investigations. We're simply trying to give the investigators the tools they need to get to the truth report back to the Congress, and then the Congress will be free to uh, take whatever action, if any, it decides uh, to take. So again, I, I thank all of you for uh, you know, your vigorous participation, but your professional demeanor and your civility and courtesy to one another. 
it uh, genuinely is a privilege to serve each and every one of you uh, with me, e even when we don't agree. And, and Mr. McGovern, like you, I wish you voted with me more often, too. So uh, we can go from there. With that, uh, do we have any further amendment? Okay, hearing no request for further amendments, the question's now on favorably reporting uh, House Resolution 918 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. For roll call. Roll call has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burgess. Mrs. Schultz, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Reschenthaler. Aye. Mr. Reschenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Massey, aye. Mr. Norman. Aye. Mr. Norman, aye. Mr. Roy. Aye. Mr. Roy, aye. Mrs. Houchin. Aye. Mrs. Houchin, aye. Mr. Langworthy. Aye. Mr. Langworthy, aye. Mr. McGovern. No. Mr. McGovern, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Nagoose. No. Mr. Nagoose, no. Ms. Ledger Fernandez. No. Ms. Ledger Fernandez, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, four nays. The ayes have it. The resolution is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the resolution. And this concludes today's business. The committee stands.